But the Septuagint, the, the Greek version called it a gigos, it's giant, the first to be a giant. You, would you say that Nimrod, biblically, there's an argument to say that Nimrod was possibly the first Nephilim post-flood? If the Septuagint is accurate in how it's translating, I, I, yeah, I think you can make that case. What a coincidence that the first Nephilim tries to build a tower, right? You could possibly say a megalith. Welcome to Benis the Menace, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we really appreciate you listening. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, share, comment. Uh, we have a giant of an episode for you today. Uh, we are going to talk about things that you won't hear at the pulpit, right? Um, and it's all biblical, right? And we need to own this narrative. So uh, without further ado, I want to in, uh, introduce our new guest here today, Tim Chafee um, out of Kentucky. And uh, he's going to be joining us for hopefully a long time tonight. And we're going to talk about some really cool, deep stuff. Um, I, I'm going to hand it over to Tim right now so that you can introduce yourself, plug 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 uh tell us about your book um and all you do and how people can find you um and then we'll dive right in all right hey guys thanks for having me on it's a pleasure to be with you um you got my name right tim chafee so we're one for one <laughs> and, all right <laughs> um uh, some people probably will recognize me from i'm the content manager at the ark encounter in the creation museum and i guess oh. since we'll start with that um the ministry behind that answers in genesis doesn't take an official view on a lot of the things we're talking about tonight you know that passage in genesis 6 1 through 4 so i just want to make sure that's clear up front people shouldn't think hey everything tim said that's exactly what they teach in the ark well we're <laughs> we're going beyond some of the things that we're, we talk about there um but sure. yeah so i did write this book it, Everybody can see that. So it's called Fallen, the Sons of God and the Nephilim. Uh, originally, that was the topic of my THM thesis back in 2011. And it was something that, um, you know, people had called me Nephilim many, many, many times in my life because I'm about six foot nine. And, and <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, yeah. And so I started to dig in a little bit. I thought, well, first of all, they're calling me giants, plural. They don't even realize it's a plural term, but that's okay. Mm. Uh, but let me. Let me see if there's anything to this passage. What is it that everybody is is talking about? And, and I'd done a little bit. I had an idea of what I thought it would be. And so I thought, well, maybe that'd be a good topic for the THM, uh, for the, the thesis. And when I started looking around, I realized there really wasn't much out there in terms of academic work. There, there's a lot of popular stuff on uh, now on YouTube and on right you know, various platforms and blogs and a lot of sensationalistic stuff that I, I thought, mm -hmm. well, let's just stick to what the scriptures say. And so I ended up doing that and, and um, was was able to defend it successfully. And I wanted to turn it into a book because there was just so much that I couldn't really include in that in that thesis. And I wanted to make it something that was readable for the average person. And so I spent a, a fair amount over the next eight years working through it. I mean, we had a lot of other things going on. I mentioned earlier the Ark Encounter, so I, I was working on that project during that time, so right. that took up a lot of time. And uh, But when I did have some free time, um, I was working on this, and it came out in 2019, and so far I've been getting a really good response to it. Um, it's almost 500 pages, which I never thought you could do 500 pages on four verses, but <laughs> oh, no, wow. you can. There's a lot to it. And um, <laughs> Uh, so that was, that was the goal. Uh, a little bit more about me, I guess. I've uh, been married to my lovely wife, Casey, for t over 27 years now. And it feels like nice. five, um, at least Good to me, probably you. 50 to her. Uh, <laughs> 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 We've got two, uh, uh, they're not children anymore, two adults, um, daughter and son. And uh, we're just very, very blessed. And I love mm -hmm. what I get to do. Um, I tell people I never have a Monday. You know, I, I hmm. get up on Mondays and I think I get to go work with people I love working with and, and do the stuff I love doing. So I write, I study, um, I get to research historical things, the Bible, and then I get to teach on those things and, and write about it. And I, I'm hmm. living the dream. So, yeah, you that's sure great. Are. Good for you, man. Thank you for sharing all that. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really good to hear. Um, what do we want to dive into right now? What I mean, Ben, We're going you're... Hey. you're, you're Dying we're diving, right we're here, diving yeah. straight in. I know. Um, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Tim. Thanks for being here. Let's just dive right in. All right. So today's topic, 
like you said, you've been called Nephilim growing up, right? Yep. And so you are the uh, proverbial expert <laughs> on the topic. All right. So we're talking about Nephilim, the giants, uh, and the biblical concept of the fallen angels, or possibly like some people are starting to call them today. And we'll touch on this a little later, Tim. Uh, possibly they are today being called aliens and extraterrestrials. <laughs> okay. So we'll talk about that a little later. But right off the bat, uh, what are the Nephilim and why do Christians believe in giants? Yeah, so that word Nephilim appears in Genesis 6-4 for the first time in the Bible. It also appears twice in Numbers 13-33. And it's the only time it appears in the Bible, those those mm. two locations, three times. And so in order to figure out who the Nephilim are, you have to figure out what that passage in Genesis 6 is about. And at the beginning of of that chapter, it says it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And then the, the sons of God took wives from whomever they chose. And then there's this verse, that's verses one and two. Verse three says, the Lord said, my spirit will not strive with man forever for his indeed flesh. At his days shall be 120 years. And then it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children in them, these were the mighty men of old men of renown. So there's a lot there, and these four verses have been debated. They have been, um, you know, depending on what your view is, if you hold the one that I do, you've probably been condemned by a lot of people. In fact, I've been told I'm going to burn in the lake of fire for all eternity because I believe that this passage is talking wow. about fallen angels uh, coming down and having uh, affairs or actually marrying women is what it says, they took mm -hmm. wives. And... Um, mm -hmm. And yet that's the the earliest view that we know of from ancient uh, Jewish writings in the intertestamental period, also the early church, uh, the first couple of centuries. This was the only view that, that was there in the first couple of centuries of the church. And it mm. wasn't until later that people started to adopt something different. And uh, so first, let's deal with that whole idea of condemning somebody who has a different view. This is not a salvific passage. <laughs> I don't right, remember right. anything in, you know, um, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him and has the right view on the Nephilim shall not perish forever. <laughs> Pretty yeah, sure that's not silly. in there. Right, um, yeah. So it's just, it's kind of weird. I mean, I know how people get there. They, they they get this idea that, well, Jesus, they think Jesus talked about this or ruled out a certain view. And they're like, well, if you have this view, you're disagreeing with Jesus. Therefore, you're not really following him. And therefore, how can you be saved? And, you know, God doesn't, he's not going to require us all to take a theology exam before he lets right. us in. And I mean, if Thank he did, God. I'm going to be pretty lonely up there. And... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. that was good. <laughs> Tim, Tim, it sounds like your head's, your head's in the clouds a little bit there, Tim. <laughs> Six foot nine, you're scraping the firmament, some would say. Uh, I'm going to be the kidding. thin air up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love it. So, okay. So it's mentioned in uh, several passages, but in Genesis and Numbers primarily, yep. right? And it's you're saying that the term specifically Nephilim mm -hmm. is mentioned in those two yes. passages, right? Because I know there's other places where giants are mentioned yeah. or the concept of giant beings are mentioned, right? Yep. And also but the term although, Nephilim. Yep. And also in the New Testament, there's places where it talks about the those angels who sinned in Noah's day. And and so it's also referring mm. back to the passage. But yeah, there are other groups in Deuteronomy 2 and 3 and also throughout um, there's a couple places in Numbers, no, earlier in Numbers 13, talking about the Anakim who are of the Nephilim and mm. so Nep the word Nephilim just means giants, you know there's a lot of people who have... That's the translation of Nephilim. Yes, yeah so a lot of people think that it means the fallen ones and that, that's what I thought when I first did my when I first started doing my research for the, the thesis and so I started looking at um, lexicons and academic commentaries and i couldn't find anybody who would support my view which is what i saw all over the place on the internet is mm. oh it means fallen ones well it, it doesn't um and, and what they're doing is they're taking the the hebrew verb nafal which if you were to take that verb and turn it into a participle to, to use it as a noun like this um it hebrew goes through um predictable changes like the the what you call the morphology so the vowel points and everything will change the word actually becomes nophilim or nephulim if you were to do that it does not become nephilim so the word mm -hmm. nephilim is actually just the plural of a word uh, nafil which means giant and so nephilim mm -hmm. is 
giants. And that's how they're described in the passage, mighty men of old, men of renown. And then later on, the Anakim, who are a people, you know, there's, it talks about the, in Deuteronomy 2, the Emim and the uh, Zamzumim being a people as great and as tall as the Anakim. Well, mm. the Anakim are tall, they're giants. And then the, in Numbers, it tells us the Anakim are of the Nephilim. So it actually describes Nephilim as giants. Uh, it talks about mm. how the people made them feel like they were grasshoppers. Um, so they, they're described as giants, and that's exactly what the word means. So are those other terms like Anakim, Zanzumim, are those, uh, would you say that's like the progeny or the, the descendants of the historic Nephilim, which are before the flood? Yeah, and they, this is just the new names they've given them? Yeah, so th there's different views on uh, among people who hold to the fallen angel view about how you could have Nephilim before the flood and also after the flood. So if you look at mm -hmm. Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, I, I think this is Moses telling us, hey, the Nephilim were on the earth before the flood. They're also there after the flood. Well, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, the very next word is, is key. It says, whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So I think that these rebellious angelic beings did it before the flood and also after the flood. Uh, you know, there's some people mm. who think, no, it was probably through like Ham's wife that she had some of this blood. And, and I don't think so. Um, mm. I think one of the purposes of the flood was to wipe out that lineage any of those things right. though then that wouldn't totally. have happened if that were the case and i think verse four plainly tells us how they got there and when they were there it's whenever the sons of god did that um mm. so to answer your question then directly like the uh, the emim and the zamzumim and the, these other giant groups I, I would look at them as like different tribes or different clans of the nephilim so if you think of nephilim being like an overarching term for giants and Got another it. one that seems to be used that way in Hebrew is uh, Rephaim. So it talks about oh, Og, yeah. uh, the king of Bashan. It talks about how Og was the last of the Rephaim. And so it seems wow. like he's the last of the giants, um, at, at least of that group. Um, oh. So that word seems to mean giants, or maybe it is just to a, a tribe of them, because we have Goliath a little bit later on. Um, mm. But yeah, then those other groups, Emim, Zamzamim, um, those would be an Anakim, um, the Amorites are also described as giants, but way uh, much further in Scripture. Back in uh, Amos, talks about mm. them as, as being giants. Uh, so those are all clans or or tribes that would be considered Nephilim. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This was. Um, have you read like Michael Heiser's work on on this stuff or Unseen Realm? Yep. Where he touches on a lot of this. Oh yeah. It wasn't. In, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until I read that book that I realized how much of the Old Testament revolves around this topic mm -hmm. of like God dealing with the Nephilim and their offspring and him trying to eviscerate that off the face of the earth, or at least protecting his chosen people, right? The Jews mm -hmm. or the Israelites from collaborating with, breeding with, getting manipulated by these, these uh, I guess this like demonic spawn. You know, yeah. Until until that came into my life, like this perspective, so much stuff to me, at least personally in the Old Testament, just didn't really like make sense. You mm -hmm. know, um, yeah. or or you come to the conclusion that God is just this vicious murderer, like He commands His people to go in slaughter men, women, children, animals, salt earth, like eviscerate entire people groups, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the that's one of the accusations against Christianity is that, oh, your God commits genocide. He commands for genocide. And until I understood the concept of the Nephilim and how it applies to the Old Testament and that it's everywhere, um, I was like, uh people kind of have a good point. Like some of this stuff's pretty messed up in here. You know what I mean? But then once you realize like, oh my God, these are literally demonic spawn that God's trying to eviscerate off the face of the earth. And some would say that that's why God sent the flood mm -hmm. was to eviscerate this in the first place. And then after the flood, when he uses his people to go in and like Nephilim hunt, you know, um, God's not doing that because he's genocidal. He's doing that because if these things take root again, he's probably going to have to flood the place again. So it's like 
oddly enough, it's like a means of grace mm. <laughs> that he goes in and just takes out certain tribes rather than let it run rampant and then have to do it all over again. You know what I mean? Send another flood yeah, or some which, other which catastrophic he, event. Yeah, which he said he would never flood it again like that. So it'd, it'd be something right, different right. It, it, rather than something water. else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would I, I, I definitely track in with what you said. The, the There's more to it than just that in Genesis 6. I mean, obviously, the people are very wicked and violent as well. The Bible tells us that. Mm, so, you know, some people right. say, well, if the angels did this, how come the people are being punished? Excuse me. It says, Every thought of man's heart was only evil continually. The whole world was right, filled with right, because right. of man, that all flesh had corrupted its way on the earth. They're pretty bad, too. And right. <laughs> so, but what you would have is if, and, and here's a lot of people who hold this view think, if the um, the reason the Nephilim are on the earth is if these fallen angels are attempting to corrupt this promised line you know in genesis three fifteen, god talks about how the the seed of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent and would crush right. the, seed of the serpent's head i should say and um if if that's going to happen and 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 it will or did uh, um if satan is aware of that and he's trying to stop that from happening how can you had a seed of the woman how can you have this promised line if suddenly all of the lineage is going to come from the fallen angels Right. Mm. right they're trying to corrupt that line so that the messiah can right. come. Mm. so then god floods the earth and starts over again and then within a few generations you get this sort of activity happening again and it's in the land of canaan where the israelites are going to uh, come back to and right. uh, which even that's really really interesting if you, if you think about where um in Genesis 15 and in 17, when God promises Abraham, they're going to have this land. And he said, I'm going to give it to your descendants, you know, as an everlasting possession. And here's, here's the, you know, where the land's going to be. He's at, uh, the Bible calls it the Oaks of Mamre, or the, mm. uh, it's in Hebron. And then mm -hmm. he tells them, your descendants are going to go and serve in a land, a people in a land that's not their own for 400 years. And then they're going to come back. Mm. Well, of course, that's referring to Egypt. When right. they come back to the land, do you remember in Numbers 13 where they saw the Anakim and it even names three of them, what city they're in? They're in this Hebron. Is, oh, they're right back there. Yeah, oh. so it's, it's, if you think about it, Abraham lived there and then Isaac lived there and then mm. Jacob lived there after he moved around a bit. And then mm. uh, Joseph, when he when he's going to visit his brothers before he's sold in slavery, it says he went up out of the Valley of Hebron. Um, so that's where they were living and that's where that promise was made. And it's almost as if they mm. overheard that and said, Hmm, once they go down, I'm going to do what I can to prevent them from coming back. And mm. when you look at where the giants are, if you plot that out, um, when the Israelites come back to the land, or at least are about to go into the land, they're all along the southern and eastern border, the two places that you'd have to come in if you're coming from Egypt. Oh, wow. And then it seems like they're headquartered right in Hebron. It's, it's as if Satan is saying, you're not getting this land back. And God's like, you want to bet? There. Wow. So you're 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 saying that like from a strategic, uh, like a tactful mm -hmm. kind of mindset. We I don't when we think of Satan, or at least when I used to, I was I was like, he, uh, he's just this like whimsical figure <laughs> in the background, like whispering naughty <laughs> things in your ear. You know what I mean? But yeah. you're uh, yeah, I from him, like a, I, I saw a meme huh? just yesterday where it has a an old guy driving and has Satan whispering in his ear, get in the left lane and drive fifty. <laughs> exactly exactly that's like that is it's, it's so silly we don't see it we don't see it as like an interdimensional or spiritual whatever language you want to use right war happening right where there's two opposing forces at at war like literally at war yep. and somehow that war infiltrates this reality that we're in and satan was using this manipulated or altered um, genetic line of his to set up forces on the border of the land that was promised to God's people mm -hmm. to keep them from going into the land promised to God's wow. people. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. What a cool I never perspective. Heard this, before. this is yeah. so great. Yeah. Well, and if you think about even during the conquest, so after the 40 years, you know, they, the spies go in and 10 of them are scared to death. Joshua and Caleb mm -hmm. are like, yeah, let's go. We can beat them. And the rest of them try to scare the people that, that you can't go in because the people are too big and powerful, you know, describing the giants there. And um, well, I think we can get into it later. They even describe them in a way that I think is, is really interesting. It says it's a mm. land that devours its inhabitants. And I, mm. I think if you take that very in a very literal way, I think it's describing them as, as cannibals. And that's wow. when they, the people get scared. And 
and they decide not to go in. Well, 40 years later, when they do go in and Joshua is fighting against them, be- defeating them. Do you remember what happens in Joshua 11, where you get Joshua's long day? Do you remember who killed, All right. who killed Dude, we're so ba- <laughs> we're bad at these tests, Sam. Okay. We just like to talk, but <laughs> we didn't study. We didn't we're not prepared for the tests. What? You didn't read the book? No, but if you remember Joshua <laughs> Long Day, the skeptics love to pick on that one too. Like how can yeah, yeah, yeah. stand still and all that kind of thing? Well, mm, so God right. gives, I remember. God gives the Israelites, you know, in a sense a double length, the extra sunlight to extra time to defeat the Amalekites. And um the uh, um, do you know who killed more of them that day, uh, or who killed most of them that day? Do you remember what the, mm. the text tells us? I'm just no. going to pull it up here so I, I quote it correctly. Um, yeah, who killed probably help most if I of them? Mention the right chapters: Joshua 10, not 11. <laughs> okay. So, and I, I think I said the Amalekites, the Amorites. Um, so, um, this is where God rained down hailstones on them, and more mm. of. So it says in verse 11. Um, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those who, the, whom the sons of Israel killed with the sword. So God is wow. actively wiping them out as well. It's not just the Israelites doing it. And mm. uh, so, in, yeah, in Joshua 10, that's where you get Joshua's long day. And then God is assisting in that process to make sure the Amorites are going to be wiped out as well. Yeah, wow. that's wild. Man. Okay, so so. I gotta read my Bible again. I'm I know the <laughs> Old Testament's wild. I just started reading the Old Testament again this is... through this lens, mm-hmm. you know, because it completely changes things. Like before, I would just read through, I would just read through the Old Testament, and a lot of it was just like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's cool. That's weird. I don't know. That doesn't matter. Like I would just kind of skim through a lot of mm-hmm. it because to me it was just like, not that I didn't believe it, but it wasn't as real to me as it is now that I have this perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, Because now it fits with what I believed earlier, which was that there's an interdimensional spiritual war going on between two opposing forces and the Nephilim, the giants, all of this. That's what the Old Testament is about, is about God hunting the remnants of that lineage, of that seed, to try to eviscerate it, to protect his people, his chosen allotment, which was Israel. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think you can I think you can go one level higher than that. I think I think there's more. Mm. Obviously, there's more to the Old Testament, which everybody would agree with that. But that is sure, a big sure. theme in the Old Testament. But one of the things that you see, it's not. And you're right. It is a spiritual battle. Paul tells us in Ephesians six, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual mm. powers. You know, and so it really is a spiritual warfare that's going on. But one of the things you see throughout the Old Testament. Um, you see it in Exodus chapter 12 when God is announcing the, the plagues and he's already done sent most of them. But, you know, then you have the, the, the firstborn that are killed. He says, I'm going to execute all my judgments on all the gods of Egypt. And if you mm. look at what happened, each of the plagues was a direct strike against one of the gods of Egypt. So the Egyptians thought, wow. well, our God who's going to do this is going to defeat Yahweh. No, he's defeated. Your God, you know, Pharaoh is like the son of, of Ra. He's, the son gets mm-hmm. blotted out for three days. He's supposed to be able to protect mm-hmm. life. He can't even protect his own son. Um, mm-hmm. And so every single thing, God is striking at the Egyptian gods and saying, I'm more powerful. And then it's not just there. That you see throughout the Old Testament. So if you think about um, David and Goliath, you have Goliath calling on his gods before they fight. And, and David says it's going to be in the name of the God of Israel, that he's going to, that's who's going to give him the victory. And then yeah. shortly before that, because Goliath, a, a Philistine, when they conquer, when they defeat the Israelites and take the Ark of the Covenant, what happens? Well, they start getting tumors and all sorts of other things. Right. And they, right. Re, and they put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple of Dagon. And all of a sudden the next day, Dagon's falling on his face. And they're like, Oh, that must have been a weird accident. They put him back up and the next day he's falling on his face again and his arms are broken yeah. off and his head's broken off. And what God is doing throughout the Old Testament is showing not only do I have power over people, over the nations, I'm more powerful than the gods of those nations. Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. you approach the Old Testament with that perspective, you begin to understand what's happening with the Israelites. Why do they continually fall into idolatry? Because they believed that Yahweh was their God, the God of Israel. and the Philistines thought Dagon was their god, and you had all these different gods. And whichever nation happens to be more powerful at that time, if the Philistines are winning, well, Dagon must be more powerful than Yahweh. Why wouldn't we worship him? 
difference right. because Yahweh is the God of heaven and earth. He is the one true God. He's eternal. These other ones are all created beings who are corrupt. And right. that's what God is demonstrating throughout the Old Testament. And of course, the Nephilim are part of that program. Yeah, yeah. This gives, I mean, it sheds whole new light on the Old Testament because until this, you know, perspective came to me or uh, or I understood it a little bit better, I just thought like every time it talked about the other nation's gods, I was like, oh, that's so weird. Why is God like obsessed with carved stone and like pieces of wood like why why does he call himself the god, the lord of lords mm. the god of all gods like if those things are fake and they're just wood and stone he seems kind of like overreacting you know <laughs> and, and then, what, what, and what then the first he like command? you shall have no other gods before me he's like well really? exactly stones and exactly yeah do you yeah. think god was just like joking or being hyperbolic you know it, he seems very very when he says i'm a jealous god I don't think he's like joking. I don't think it's just because he doesn't want people bowing down and adoring like stone and wood. I think that this perspective and the giants is just, or the Nephilim is just a piece of it because those are the physical three dimensional kind of representations of what those gods are doing to alter God's plan. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just one of the weapons that they've brought into, into, um, this world to try to affect what God promised, right? Yeah, well, um, uh, and to finish what you were saying earlier, when when mm. God is compared to those other gods, not only is he called, you know, Lord of Lords or anything, but when it says you are higher than all other gods, it's like, well, if, mm. if they're non-existent beings, if it's a piece of, what are you praising him for? You're, Lord, God, you're right. better than nothing. It's like, well, right. well, well, that's not that impressive. No, it's saying you're more powerful than the most powerful thing these people can think of in all of right. creation and and he's he's the highest yeah yeah the old testament takes like other gods very seriously mm -hmm. we well, can say the that New testament does too um that's you know, true paul yeah. talks about that that uh, for us there's one lord and one god but he says we know there are many gods and then you think about when um paul is traveling and they think that he's hermes and you know <laughs> and, mm, and Zeus. Right. you know he think they right. think zeus and hermes have come down to him and and they're like no 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 mm. which we're just men like you, and we're delivering the, the real message. And so they were dealing with the Greek and the Roman gods at that time. And in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you've got the Canaanite gods, you've got the Babylonian gods. Yeah, um, yeah. You've got, uh, so wherever they went, the, uh, the Assyrian gods, the, that that's one of my favorite ones. You have when Hezekiah is defending Jerusalem, you know, and you have um, Sennacherib comes down to Jerusalem to try to defeat it. And he sends one of his spokesmen there to the wall. And he starts taunting the Israelites and like, hey, speak to us in this language. We don't like, no, we want everybody to hear it because these are the guys who are going to be drinking, well, yeah, drinking their own urine. That kind of, it's a little crude, but um, <laughs> he's trying to scare them. And he says, here's what my master says. Where, um, where are the gods of this nation and this people and this people? They couldn't stop my master from doing what he's going to do. What do you, mm, what makes yeah. you think that your God's going to be any different? Oh, you, you made a big mistake uh, because mm. Yahweh is not like these other gods. He is the one true God. And uh, so what happened? Oh, yeah. One angel went out and killed 185,000 of their men. And mm, that was yeah. it. Um, so even that is a it shows that spiritual warfare taking place and that God is going to be. God will show that he is the, the highest authority. Yeah, it's the Old Testament so much better. Yeah. now. It's, <laughs> it's so cool. It's so like, rich. We, yeah, it's yes. so it's yeah. so cool. Like it's so you think all these like Avenger movies have good plots and stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you understand like the themes of the old Testament and you see these things over and over again, it's just the wildest story ever. It's like an interdimensional game of risk, you know, mm -hmm. that we're just like watching unfold and we're like, Oh, that's a good move. Oh, I could see why he did that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I have so much more fun with it now, <laughs> as opposed to before where I just try to like skim through it. Cause I'm like, ah, I don't know. This stuff's boring, you know? Um, okay. So that's a good, big picture mm -hmm. on Nephilim um, or the concept of Nephilim fallen angels. Um, let me ask, or, okay, let me, let me ask you a question. Is it fair to say that this concept of Nephilim fallen angels, it had one meaning or it had certain implications pre-flood and it has other implications post-flood? Can we kind of divide it up and talk about what does the Nephilim world and the 
fallen angel world look like pre-flood? Hmm. Um, I've heard, I've heard concept or, or ideas or theories that the Nephilim were involved in building the Great Pyramids, right? The oldest, the oldest pyramids, not the ones that were built by the Egyptians, mm -hmm. but that they were trying to mirror or mimic construction that they kind of stumbled upon after a global cataclysm, which nowadays almost, it's funny, almost very few people deny the fact that there was a global cataclysm that basically reset humanity. And it's like, hey, I'm glad you guys are catching up, but some of us has, have been saying this for a couple thousand years, <laughs> actually more, you know, about 4,000. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think that, if I could ask a specific question, do you think that fallen angels and Nephilim being a reality on the planet for, I don't know, I don't know how long, mm -hmm. how long do you think that they were around for actually before the flood? Yeah. So you're left to speculate. I mean, if you, mm. if you look at the genealogy that is there in Genesis five, if you're using the Masoretic text, you have a total of about 1,656 years from Adam to the flood. Mm. And I, I don't think this is going on from day, you know, day 10 or anything like that, or from the second or third year. Um, I think it, like the book of Enoch talks about it in the days of Jared or something like that. But of course that's, that's speculating as to when that would be. Sure. Um, but it does seem to make sense that it would be, you know, it says when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, it seems like as the population was, was growing quite a bit, it doesn't seem like it's in the very earliest days. Um, so, so not the earliest, but still pretty early, right? Yeah, I mean, let's say that you have 500 years of it, okay? That's still mm. a lot of time where you have these rebellious angels on the earth with women, and then their offspring are the Nephilim. And that, that's one thing to keep straight. A lot of times people think, oh, Nephilim is referring to the angel. No, it's not. It's that the, they're the offspring and then the, the lines that come from that. So they're just mm. the giants who, who come from the, these illicit unions between angels and humans. Um so okay, just speculating, let's say 500 years, what would that world look like? Um, even if they were building, you know, these tremendous structures that we think about, the, um, these what, megaliths, that kind of stuff. I don't think those things survive the flood. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the flood is to destroy that world. Peter tells us that that world perished. And I think it completely changed every the, the entire landscape. So I don't I don't think the, the Great, Pyramid, Great Pyramid predates the flood. Uh, it would be something that the Egyptians built post-flood. Um, mm. Could they have built huge structures like that before the flood? Sure. Uh, I think they could have done that. Uh, was it different? Uh, were the, what was like the purpose of the Nephilim pre-flood? Or um, could that have Not been what was their purpose, but what would, what would... Okay, what I'm trying to get at specifically is, do you think that the fallen angels... Because this is what other, this is what other um, ancient civilizations man, almost unanimously said to some degree or other, uh, things came to us at some point in time mm -hmm. from wherever, okay? Uh, they gave us uh, intelligence. They gave us hidden knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, ideas about farming, technology, war. Um, and these are civilizations that were post-flood. Yep. And they're claiming that these entities or beings or whatever you want to call them came and handed them this knowledge. Yep. Okay. And if that's what they're claiming, and they're secular, they're pagan, they're whatever you want to call them, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they're claiming. That's what they're claiming post flood. Now, if as Christians we believe, hey, they're likely talking about the fallen angels, which we have reference to in Genesis 6, right? Mm hmm. Uh, is it possible that those same beings came down pre-flood and were doing the same kind of shenanigans pre-flood as these ancient civilizations claim happened post-flood, you know? So would their pre-flood world, let's say it was for 500 years that these shenanigans were afoot, would their pre-flood world have been advanced technologically? Could they have, could there, could that be why, and I know you're saying that you don't believe the the Great Pyramid was built pre-flood because mm -hmm. it should have been destroyed. But I mean, that's a pretty big monument well, or a pretty big you. megalith. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Water well, well, may have taken some of the structures away, but you might need uh, 
you might need, well, I guess there was a lot of water, so I can't even say you might need a lot of water. Well, <laughs> the thing is the Great Pyramid is built on top of flood plains. It is built on top of flood layers. Right? And so mm. it, it, there was a flood there. And not just like the mm. average, the, you know, the annual Nile River flooding or anything that, that's on top of the same sedimentary layers that we find around the world that are we think are caused by the flood. Um, but to go, I think you can answer your, your question another way. In, in still the same still holding to what we believe as Christians, that there was a worldwide flood and that each of these cultures. Oh, totally. Um, so what happened after the flood? God tells people, Noah and his family, be fruitful, multiply, multiply and fill the earth. They were fruitful and they multiplied, but they didn't fill the earth. Instead, they gathered together mm. in the plain of Shinar. They start building a city and a tower, trying to make a name for themselves. And what we read in Genesis 10, um, bef- you know, this is the setup. This is like the genealogy before what happened at Babel. And it tells us that um, when it's talking about Nimrod, um, he became a mighty one on the earth is how the new American standard puts it. Um, like the Septuagint says he was the first to be a gigas. Uh, he was the, um, so here's the ESV. He was the first to be a, a mighty man. First one, first on earth to be a mighty man. Uh, mm. that's the word gibberim, but the Septuagint, the, the Greek version called it a gigas. It was giant. The first to be a giant. Wow. Really? What, what if at Babel, or right before Babel, this kind of stuff is taking place. And then when the people scatter around the globe, they are taking that information with them. And, mm. and of course, it gets distorted in their new language. It yeah. gets handed down. Or the other possibility is in what's happening at Babel, and you're familiar with this with uh, Dr. Heiser's work, is God is disinheriting the nations. In right. Fact, where he puts right. them under the authority of these rebellious sons of God. Deuteronomy 32, 8 talks about that. And so it could be that once he does that, then that secret information they're getting is from these rebellious beings mm. and, uh, or a combination of both those things. Um, well, that's really interesting. So so in you, would you say that Nimrod, biblically, there's an argument to say that Nimrod was possibly the first Nephilim post-flood? I, if, if the Septuagint is accurate in how it's translating, I, I, yeah, I think you can make that case. Um, there's something really interesting about his lineage so l- let me read genesis 10 6 it starts off these yeah. the, the sons of ham cush egypt uh Mithraim, put in canaan and then it says the sons of cush seba havala sabta rama septika and then it goes on in verse 8 it says cush fathered nimrod like, wait how come hmm. nimrod wasn't mentioned in verse 7 when it says the sons of Cush, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Rama, and Septika. Where's Nimrod? He's not there. Mm-hmm. And then it says Cush fathered Nimrod. It uses, it's a different terminology. So here are the sons of it, and then Cush did this. Is it possible that he became the father of Nimrod in a way that's different than his other sons? Mm-hmm. That maybe mm-hmm. more of like a, maybe he's not his biological son, but maybe his, maybe Cush's wife had him mm-hmm. in a different way, you know, with I think the text leaves that open for us. Yeah, there's like a door open for that. That's that's so interesting because um, what a coincidence (laughs) that the first Nephilim tries to build a tower, right? Mm -hmm. You could possibly say a megalith, uh, to reach the heavens, Mm -hmm. right? Do you think that Nimrod was trying to build a tower to like, see the clouds i think reach the heavens is probably much more significant of a phraseology than just like have a great vantage point you know yeah it's it, uh, it's a little weird because the the language or the same exact wording that's used where it says that the top is in the heavens it, hmm. it's used of some of the walls of the cities that in the land of canaan their their walls are in the heavens it's the same terminology so i don't think that it has to be you know, the skyscraper, like you see in these mm. many, you know, these Renaissance paintings or anything like that. In fact, if you think about the population on the earth at that time, it's pretty low. I don't think the tower is going to be real big at all. Um, and if, if you have only seen a tent before, you know, what does it look like to have a tower whose top? In the, I mean, if you built something 40 or 50 or 60 right. feet high, that's going to feel like a skyscraper mm. when you're used to something eight feet high or 10 feet high. But um, yeah, I, I think it has more to do with the, um, with the pride of man that God says scatter and we're saying, no, we're going to stay here and we're making a name for ourselves and we're going to show how powerful and great we are. And, uh, and God says, no, you're going to scatter and 
like. <laughs> right. Um, and here's how it's going to happen. But um, yeah, I mean, th- I know there's speculation about what was at the top. Is it is it that they were worshiping, you know, these pagan gods? Because that's what you mm. have around the world. You have the, the one everybody's familiar with are the Olympians. So you have uh, Mount Olympus and the Greeks would believe that Zeus and Hera and Ares and all these gods were up on on Mount Olympus. Well, the Canaanites had the same sort of thing. The, uh, you know, Mount Siphon, um, these other nations have very similar concepts where their gods met on mountains. And right. um, it, it could be that maybe that's what they're attempting to do. Maybe in the, the plain of Shinar, there's not a mountain there. So let's make our own little mountain so where the gods their come own. and meet with us. Yeah. So it's almost as if it doesn't necessarily have to be a tower, you know, to breach the atmosphere or whatever. But it's language um, that implies that maybe they're trying to reconnect to those spiritual forces that they knew about or heard about because their ancestors just survived the flood a few hundred years back, you know? So maybe they're trying to reconnect to those forces. And what a coincidence that if Nimrod is Nephilim, right, Mm -hmm. and he's a mighty, I think it says mighty warrior before the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the only other people called um, mighty men were the mighty men of renown of back in the day, you know? So now mighty is being used of both parties, Mm -hmm. mighty men of renown, Nimrod's mighty warrior before God. That's kind of interesting. Like God's saying that this guy's a mighty thing or a mighty being. Or a mighty mighty hunter. Yeah, I think a lot of trends. Or mighty hunter. Um, so it's interesting to me that he might be Nephilim post flood. He might be the first, he starts building some kind of structure to reach the heavens, or I could see that as a way to reconnect those forces to humanity possibly. Yeah. Can I, um, can I give you a little bit of crazy speculation on Nimrod? Yes, oh, please. please <laughs> do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm you could you could so speak much. as freely as you want. I haven't even like started. <laughs> so you're, you're trying to think of the, like connections to Greek gods or Roman gods or the Babylonian gods or anything like that. Babylonian, Canaanite, so Sumerian. I, I talk about this. There's a chapter in my book where I get into this toward the end about the constellations that we have in the night sky. And what's sure. really interesting is you have cultures like Native American cultures and cultures in the Middle East that look at Ursa Major and they call it like this great bear. And I look at the night sky and I'm like, that doesn't look like a bear. Why in the world would both these peoples on the opposite sides of the world call this a bear? And right. you have other things like that, too. You have like the um, the Pleiades, you know, the star cluster that there's seven bright stars, but there's really thousands of them there. And the Greeks and even the Aborigines and even like in Mexico, they call them the seven sisters. And it's like, why? Why are they hmm. calling them the same things in different hmm. places? Is it possible that hmm. a lot, I'm not saying every one of the constellations, but a lot of those things were named before people scattered from Babel, and then they kind of handed that down. That's interesting. Well, which one is the hunter in the sky? It, I'm failing this Orion. <laughs> okay, so he, he's, it's the only one that actually looks like what people claim, you know, mm, you know this mm. thing, or it does look like this guy standing there. And so he's right. called, and in Greek, uh, in Greek mythology, he is a demigod, so he's a, right. the son of uh, of an Olympian god and a human woman, and he is a mighty hunter. Mm. So what if at Babel, that's where that gets named, and what if it's actually named after the guy we've been talking about, after Nimrod? Interesting. Mm. What, the constellation is named after yeah. Nimrod? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it just it's yeah. interesting that it's called a mighty hunter or they the call the hunter, hunter around. Yeah. Right. But that one I kind of get, he kind of looks like it, but these other ones, they don't look like it. So it could be that we have a little bit of a nod to that in scripture that, um, you know, that here's, the, here's who this guy, or here's who it's named after. Here's the mighty hunter. And this, right. This character in the sky is called the mighty hunter. I don't know. It's speculation. I like it. Feel free <laughs> to speculate, my friend. That's what we're here for. These, these conversations are so fun, man. They're, I know it's not like definitive and it's not going to be like, yes, and here's why, or no, and here's why. Well, good. But, I got another one for you if we can, yes, if we want yes. to hear the Greeks. From, Bring it. Remember I mentioned earlier with the, with the spies when they come back from the land mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they are, they're telling them, hey, it's a good land. You know, they bring back the produce. They've got these grapes hanging off this pole and they're talking mm-hmm. about how it's a great land and, and it's, you know, fruitful. And the people are like, all right, let's go. And then the spies say, no, no, no. Um, the, the cities there are, are, you know, 
fortified and there we saw the Anakim and we felt like grasshoppers in their, you know, in their sight. And um, so basically trying to scare them. And then that's when they say it's a land that devours its inhabitants. And mm-hmm. a lot of commentaries will say things like, well, it's a land that's war torn. There, there, you know, it's always battles. And I'm thinking, well, that's good because that means they should be worn out and depleted and the Israelites can just march right in and take it. Right. Um, or they, they come up with all sorts of things. But if we take that in a very straightforward way, that the, the land it devours the inhabitants and essentially these nephilim that they're warning that the people about they're trying to scare them are actually eating people mm-hmm. um so let's think about the time period that's around 1400 bc when joshua and uh, when joshua finally goes into land is 1400 so 40 years earlier when the spies refused uh right after the exodus so when joshua and um the Israelites go into the land. It says in, I'm going to read it here. Um, and Joshua came, Joshua 11, 21. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab. And it goes on and it says, there was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, so that some remain. So only mm-hmm. Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Later on, Goliath is from Gath. Goliath's brothers or his offspring, depending on how that word gets translated, are in Gaza and Gath. It talks about David's mighty men fighting Uh these guys. Mm. But um, if the Israelites are coming from the south and or the southeast when they're coming into the land, you know, where Jericho is and then they spread out. If you were one of these Nephilim and you were being driven out of land, either you're being wiped out or driven out, what direction do you go? Well, you have to go either north or west, which is in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, speculation time. A couple hundred years later, there is a big, famous battle at Troy, correct? So, the Greeks mm-hmm. tell us all about this. And there's a famous man who tries to get home, and it takes him a really long time to get home. He's got 21 ships that leave from there. Uh, Odysseus, if you're, uh, people are wondering. So, the Odyssey is all about this guy. Um, mm. So after the Battle of Troy, he tries to get home. The very first island he stops at is the island of the Lystragonians, and it's in the Mediterranean. And his people, a couple of people go ashore, and they see a giantess, a female giant, w- walking, and they, they follow her to like the, the where the king is. And he's a giant, and they're asking for assistance. And the king grabs two of the guys, dashes them against the ground, and starts to eat them. And the other guys take wow. off running to the ships and giants come down from the hillside and they start throwing these rocks and sinking all the ships and going in and spearing the men like fish. Uh-huh. And then only one ship survives. That's Odysseus's. And he takes off. And the next island he lands at is the island of the Cyclops, who is a giant that eats people. Wow. And what if, and I'm not saying everything in the Odyssey is exactly right in this true literal history, sure, and we, sure. but a lot of times things that are legendary like that are based on real events. At least there's a historical core right. to it. And there was a Battle of Troy, and I think right. probably a guy who had a tough time getting home, maybe one of their generals you know, trying to get home. Uh, what if these tales that we just think of as being as, as crazy and out there are actually rooted in some historical truth what if there really were man-eating giants on mm. those places and oh, by the way where are they from oh they're the offspring of the gods and women and mm. they eat people which would match what you have in in um in numbers they're the offspring of the gods or angelic beings and women and you even have this is going to sound weird but even like jack and the beanstalk so you have oh, giant, sure. They have a hankering for human flesh, right? That's what they want. Sure, to eat. sure. And where do they live? Yeah, that's a good point. Where do they, they're yeah. halfway between heaven and earth. Yeah. Mm. And it's so you have that sort of mythology around the globe, and maybe it's actually rooted in reality. And it's right. other cultures' distortions or, or echoes of the truth. Right. Yeah, that's, I totally believe that. And a few extra uh, arrows in this quiver here. I think it was, do you know who Tom Horn is? Mm, I know the name. From, yeah. mm-hmm. Okay. So I think he works with the group called Prophecy Watchers. I think he's passed oh, away yeah. a little bit ago yeah. here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Tom Horn was doing some research about, I forget which Native American tribe. It was here in America. Um, and he was talking to one of their elders. Um, and lo and behold, in their Native American lore, they have accounts of 
uh, giant cannibals mm -hmm. with red hair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this was prevalent amongst those people groups there. Multiple tribes had these accounts of, of um, giants with red hair that ate humans. And then there's also another account. I think it was in Afghanistan. This one is a little more conspiratorial. The, Kand the Kandahar giant, yeah. Giant of Kandahar. Mm -hmm. Red-haired giant who was also a cannibal. And yeah. this was in Afghanistan, right? I wonder if Homer talks about, in the Odyssey, I wonder if he talks about uh, the hair what color, color hair <laughs> they had. I, that would be a smoking gun, in my opinion, <laughs> if I've ever seen one. You know what I'm talking I've got about? I a copy of it right up here, but it would be oh, a while man. to try to find it. You'll, yeah, you'll have to see. I, I, don't I wonder. Think... I don't think it ever describes the hair color, but I, I don't know. Um, Wouldn't that be interesting, though, it, if it, it really be, did? That would be interesting. I mean, I, with a lot of these things, um, I, I think there's legendary development that happens. Sure, uh, sure. And so things get, you know, distorted. But I, again, I think there is a kernel of truth. And, you know, I, there was um, with the Buffalo Bill Cody talked to some of the natives or reported that they talked about how giants used to rule the land or it, yeah. they'd run around and they could pick up a buffalo in one arm and you know while they're still running which I, yeah. I don't know if they're really that big but it, still that whole idea of giants um around the globe but there's even another one where uh there's i think it was a canadian tribe that talked about how um they they believed that they're before the great flood you know the people were wicked and there were giants and the floodwaters kept coming god sent the flood and the floodwaters kept going and giants climbed to the highest mountains and they shook their fist at god and then eventually they were drowned and um why would they have that legend and it's so yeah it just seems like you can get little bits and pieces of the the truth from around these ancient cultures and then the bible is giving us the real account of what happened and, right right yeah yeah, it's interesting because even uh, Homer is, I, I think Homer is also the one who's like grandpa went to Egypt, visited with the priests there. Okay. I think his name was Solon and then came back because Homer is the one that perpetuated the, the idea of Atlantis, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And he said that it was his grandfather who went to Egypt gained the knowledge of this pre-Diluvian, pre-flood, pre-catastrophe civilization that was hyper advanced. And that uh and then and then Solon, Homer's grandfather, brought this back to Homer and he's the one that talks about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And most people thought that he was talking about it kind of in a mythical, uh figurative way, but that's not what Homer or his grandfather or the or the priests in Egypt thought. They actually thought Atlantis was a real place and it existed before a catastrophe, which they all said was a global flood. What mm -hmm. a quinker dinker, you know? They, there's so many accounts from multiple, completely unrelated um, ancient civilizations that all say a flood happened at some point in human history yep. and it, re it reset humanity and it reset the world. And this is why I was asking... Um, if you think the pre-flood world may have been um, advanced technologically, um, this might also answer why we still don't necessarily know definitively how certain megaliths were built or why they have stone that looks like it's melted, um, things like that. Because mm -hmm. to me, it's like, hold on, if Nimrod was the first uh nephilim post flood and the first thing he tries to do is build this tower and most people say in that territory when they're talking about a tower they're likely talking about a ziggurat yeah. or something that resembles a pyramid yeah what a coincidence so nimrod the first nephilim is building a pyramid to do what i don't think nimrod thought it was a tomb for for pharaohs no you know ziggurats are not tombs like pyramids are tombs some of the pyramids are tombs but ziggurats are uh, meant to be like stairways to heaven pardon you know led zeppelin exactly they're, they're supposed to be this, this place mm -hmm. uh, in fact the names of some are like stairway between heaven and earth and so they're supposed to be a connecting place between the physical world and the spiritual realm and yeah so this is why all this thing all these things tim lead me to you know this crazy idea speculation obviously but Nimrod was trying to reestablish this demonic connection that they had pre-flood, mm -hmm. and uh, and the 
the pyramids were a means of that connection. And so somehow, whether it was through like sacrifice, through worship, through whatever, um, whatever you want to call it, right? That the pyramids allowed for some sort of interdimensional uh, shenanigans, okay? And sure, I totally believe that the flood eviscerated all humanity outside of Noah and his family. I totally believe it, it changed the face of the world as we know it. These guys probably popped out of the boat and were like, hey, where's all that beautiful vegetation that we've come to love so much? Like, who knows what kind of, what kind of like vegetation we lost? in this new world post flood mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah because no one uh, wasn't required to bring the plants on the ark it was just the land animal right so there may right. have been he, different kinds of plants that were were lost although Tim, he might have got off the boat and been like what's a desert yeah. and why is there <laughs> sand everywhere i think it would have been muddy, you know what i mean but yeah and there, you probably yeah, would have yeah. had <laughs> you probably would have had some maybe some carcasses and you would have had like the tree stump I mean, not stumps but like the debris all over the place but they, yeah there's no not very much for green because the you know the, the he's sending the the raven out he sends the dove out and it brings back an olive leaf um right so there was something regrowing it took a, a few months but things finally started to regrow um and that actually well, i don't want to get too far off track but that might be one of the reasons why he brings um seven or 14 depending on which translation you read mm. of, of all of the birds is because they're going to scatter faster than everything else they can help to regrow the environment you know they eat seeds they mm. drop seeds and that's then a good they point can, they can help the environment regrow before the other animals and before people get there but that gets, right. gets us a little bit off point uh one thing i sure. do want to just again speculate a little bit pre-flood what what's going on there with the nephilim and um why in the middle of that passage um you have this genesis 6 3 where god says my spirit will not um, strive with man or some translation yeah. they abide in man forever right. for he is indeed flesh and his day shall be 120 years that's right in between the sons of god in verses one and two, and then the sons of God in the Nephilim in verse four. And it's just like God breaks in the middle of there and, and tells us about how man's only going to live 120 years. But what's going on there? I, I think what happens is, you know, originally Adam and Eve are supposed to live eternally. That They're, they're created not to die. Right. They, right. And God tells them, you're gonna, if you eat this, you're going to die. Well, they ate it and they were going to die. And, and as far as we know, nobody lived a thousand years. They get to the 900s and then that seemed to be it. Methuselah 969. Maybe there's people that aren't talked about that lived longer. We don't know. Mm. Um, but then uh, this event happens and God said, now you get 120 years. And what you see is from Noah who lived 950, the next generation out of the flood, 600 down into the 400s, all the way down to a guy named Moses who wrote this passage, who lived 120. And since Moses, only one person, Jehoiada the priest lives to 120 or he lived mm. 130. Um, but nobody else is, is breaking that as far as we know. So, why that? Why did God reduce it? What if the, again, speculating, what if the women who are involved in this, you know, marrying these and having offspring with these rebellious angels, what if they thought by doing that, by having offspring with uh, eternal or immortal beings, their offspring will be immortal? So right. there's, a way, mm. there's a way to circumvent death. And mm. their our offspring are going to live forever. And God said, "You want to bet 120 years now, bang." And yeah. So I it, mean, think about all the other accounts, like the demigods. They weren't they immortal too. I. It's weird when you think about these these immortal things. Like, yeah, they're immortal unless they get their head cut off. It's, it's almost that's bit, true. That's right? true. <laughs> right. The Highlander is that the? Yeah. It's like yeah, <laughs> well, well, same con same concept. Yeah. I mean, the women thought their offspring would be immortal Possibly, and, yeah. may, and yeah. maybe they lived a very long time mm -hmm. until a flood came and yeah. then they got killed so you could be killed but if you're not killed then maybe you live a and prolonged I'm, period and i'm not saying that that would have worked i, I sure, you know, sure, I, sure i don't know i'm just that that's speculating on my part i don't know that any, i've heard anybody else say that but it seems yeah. like maybe one of the motives for the women um sure it could just be that they were very attractive i mean if you think of mm. one of the reasons people uh, they don't like this view they're like like humans would ever fall for like these you know horn horned and pointy tail and hooked <laughs> and you know warty toad demons like right you're thinking of it all wrong think of um right uh, think of thor from marvel movies and, and jane that's that's a uh norse god and a human woman um, or to put it the other way around if you remember the bedazzled movie with with brendan fraser 
uh, from the early two mm. thousand. I think um, Satan comes to him as Elizabeth Hurley. Yeah. I mean, okay. Now that I understand it. this would be you know, there's a real temptation there. You have a beautiful right, woman, or right. you have you know Chris Hemsworth if, if you're a lady and you're looking at the guy. You, right. Not, they're not going to appear in the grossest horrible form. They're going to be very attractive. And I don't even know. What, I think that concept of Satan being this horn thing yeah. and demons being these little weirdos that are on your shoulder, that only arose in like medieval art. Mm -hmm. Before that, I mean, biblically, we've got Satan's like the pinnacle of God's creation, angelic creation. Uh, he's like the most beautiful thing. He's an angel of light. There's no, there's no mention outside, maybe like Revelation, where he's called like a the dragon. dragon. Yeah, seven headed. You know, yeah. um, but I don't think that that's his permanent like bodily form. Is right. that he's a dragon that floats around? You know, um, if dude, if anything, I mean, when God came with angels to Abraham, mm -hmm. the 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 guys in Sodom wanted to rape them. Right. They were, so they obviously were. I, I attractive to some degree for that right yeah yeah so i don't think that they're i don't think that they have to be this like grotesque thing that we imagine or that that we've been um that we've been sold through the medieval through the medieval era um and even i mean i think it's in the book of enoch where it talks about uh and again enoch's outside of the canon you know but it's interesting like historical mm -hmm. cultural knowledge um because that was around during like the second temple period and yep. stuff so so they were they were learning from it they were talking about it it was a cultural relevant of cultural relevance um and i think noah's dad said or he was he was concerned that his wife bred with an angel because noah was fair skinned blue eyed and had blonde hair yeah i don't think it's book of enoch maybe that has where is that but the genesis genesis apocryphon has that and mm -hmm. it's it's a little uh, bit weird it's a like it's got one column and then the other column is kind of missing certain things because it's, it's broken up and um so there's they're trying to fill in what it might have been and somebody did this whole dissertation on on the genesis apocryphon but yeah the, the passage is really weird like it's um so it is yeah noah's dad lamech goes to his his own dad methuselah and is concerned about his wife that maybe when she's mm. pregnant with noah and he's concerned that that the baby's not his that it belongs to one of the watchers or to one of these an, angelic beings and it, it reads a little um it, it, song of solomon-ish at one point where okay, okay. where the where noah's wife is kind of, or not no lamech's wife is scolding him saying don't you remember that night when you know your breath was on me and that kind of when we did uh -huh, <laughs> to remind uh -huh. him well this is your baby and <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's hilarious mm -hmm. but it's okay it didn't come out grotesque and horned and da -da 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 -da. right you know what i mean mm -hmm. it came out some would say beautiful you know um so that's an interesting listen Tim, feel free to speculate here this yeah, is I mean, a safe space I, I, for anybody in that case it wasn't because of fallen angel but even even right. in that case the bible never tells us that the the nephilim were ugly or that they were right. the grotesque things um that's true they, they were big they were they were very tall and they were powerful they weren't just you know so many people think oh well we have giants today you know you have like robert wadlow is 8 11 and three quarters or something no wow that's different that's uh, those it's are just, the modern giantism is like you get a you get a, a tumor a on your pituitary gland, right. and or there's some other really weird or rare um, um, genetic disorders that can cause extreme height. But in almost every single case, they're very, um, very. I don't want to say sickly, but they're they're um, uncoordinated. They right. they don't live very long. It's not right. hereditary. So hmm. if so if one of these giants were to have modern giants were to have offspring, it doesn't mean they get it. They don't have the tumor on the pituitary. And yet right. in the Bible, what you have is entire clans of these entities that they're the, the giants have giants and they keep on having giants. It, it's very right. different in their warriors. They're not, you know, really slow and uncoordinated. They're, it's yeah, very different. That's true. I have a question. Yeah. How I, I just, I, I never understood this part. Like how, does a inter interdimensional being or like a spiritual being like 
have Go a ahead, wife Dennis, of, we're uh, adults. <laughs> <laughs> how do they how can they do that with a with a with a human woman right how yeah. do yeah. they change do they come into this form do they get an earth suit what do they do like how is this i just don't understand that yeah so when you look in scripture we have that passage in hebrew that tells us to be hospitable to strangers some people have entertained angels unaware um mm. and it seems as if angels are capable of taking on human form um whether it's on their own ability that god gave them that ability or if god empowered them at a certain time which, which is some would argue but it never tells us that uh, we know in genesis 18 the passage we were just talking about with the angels coming down with god to abraham um right. they eat and drink with abraham and then they right. go into sodom and they grab lot by the hand and they yank him out of the right. so they can do all sorts of physical things in daniel 9 uh, gabriel comes to daniel and, and daniel says the man gabriel uh mm. Anthony, so he appears in the form of a man um if they like can shape shifters uh, shape shifters well or what what form do they have right now i mean when we think of them as being spiritual beings they're not they're not spiritual in the sense of no body whatsoever. They have hmm. form. They're they're composed of something. You know, they're not they're not um, spaceless. They're not um, omnipresent. It, so they they do have a I'm going to say quote unquote body of some sort. Hmm. Um, I don't know what it's made out of. One of the um, one of the systematic theology books I have called them angel stuff. Okay, well, let's, they're made hmm. of angel stuff, whatever that might be. <laughs> um, but when they, the ones who do or can, you know, when they take human form, it appears that they're capable of just doing, you know, performing human functions, uh, eating hmm. and drinking, grabbing someone by the hand and perhaps reproducing. You know, some people say, well, angels can't create life. We're not talking about creating life. We're talking about procreation. I can't yeah. create life, but I, I've got two kids, you know, procreation. And so are they capable of doing that? Um, you know, one of the objections to that hmm. is, first, let's get this out of the way. So many people, you might have a few listeners who are like, what are they even talking about? If they've stuck with us for the, an hour, they're probably not having <laughs> an objection anymore. But so many people are like, oh, Jesus said the angels can't do No, he did not. And can't what? Point, that they, the angels can't get married. He didn't say that. He said the angels uh -oh. in heaven don't marry. He never said anything mm. about the ones who rebelled against God and left heaven, or as Jude talks about, they left their proper abode. He never said what the mm. ones who left are capable of doing, he just said the, what, what the ones in heaven don't do. Mm. So mm. you can't use that verse, Matthew 22, 30, and then say, well, Jesus spoke against the fallen angel view. No, he actually didn't. Um, mm. So I, I want to make sure I get that out there, because that's the, that's the number one objection that people say all the time. And uh, another ob objection would be, and I think this gets to the point we were just talking about, um, you know how in Genesis 1 it talks about how the plants will bring forth after their kind, the animals will bring forth after their kind. Right. Like dogs will always have dogs, cats will always have cats. And so if humans are going to always have humans, how could angels come down and do this with humans? Because that's different kinds, right? Well, first of all, it never says that about humans. It only says about mm. the plants and the animals. Now, assuming that that principle still holds true, true for humans, what if angels are also made in God's image? Now, the, the Bible never comes right out and says that they are necessarily, it's not directly. But what if, mm. who is God talking to when he says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and then God does make man? Um, you have other passages, like in Genesis 11, where God said, let us go down and there confuse their language. And you have, right. um, you've read Heiser's book, you know about this whole divine counsel language, where God is speaking right. to these other beings. I think in the West, a lot of times we've just assumed, oh, this is inter-Trinitarian inter dialogue. Trinity. Yeah. I don't think so. I think he's speaking to the heavenly host or to his divine mm. counsel, if you will, these other uh, spiritual beings. He rules over them. He makes the decisions. but he he allows them to give input. And you see that right. with um, Micaiah in 1 Kings 22, where um, Oof, yeah. he, sees, he sees God on his throne and the host of heaven all around him. He's telling Ahab and Jehoshaphat, you know, here's what I saw. Um, and God says, who's going to go and persuade Ahab that he's going to fall at remote Gilead? And one spirit says this, another one says this, and finally one says, I'll go, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouths of his prophets. Well, who's right. that? Right there in God's mm -hmm. throne room, you have somebody who's saying, I'm going to go tell a lie. And right. God says, go ahead. So it's as if God is seated over this council and he gets to make all the judgments. He gets to 
act. He does all those things, but right. he allows them to participate. And I think it's possible that's what you have, even when God says that in Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. Therefore, angels would also be made in God's image. Um, mm-hmm. They're not the ones doing the creating because the very next verse says, then God made man in his own image. But right. he, he allowed them to provide input, if you will. Um, and yeah. So if both so if, angels and humans would be in God's image, that's not a violation of the, the kind thing at all. Not at all. Yeah. yeah, I think if anybody's confused about what we're talking about, because we're getting into the into the weeds, you know, we're getting deep and we love doing this, Tim. If anybody's confused about this, then you got to read the 500 page book. There you, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Boom. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Love what it. is it called again? Um, it is Fallen, the Sons of God and the Nephilim. So, and you yeah. go through all this stuff too uh, about sure. uh, Elohim and sons of God. And... Oh yeah, in fact, nice. the first half of the book I is all wait. about the who are the sons of God. So before it even gets into the Nephilim, other than like the very first introductory chapter, kind of introducing the the passage, um, the first sixteen chapters are all about who are the sons of God. It goes through the various approaches that people take. It goes through. I think there's five chapters just addressing the objections to the fallen angel view, including the one, mm. the two that we just talked about, um, showing that it holds up uh, all the different objections that you can think of. In fact, I've probably heard a lot more than you can think of because I've been doing this for a while, and I want to put right. them in there. I'm not. I'm not skipping any of them. And nice. what I found is that a lot of times the biggest argument for the other views, you know, some people say, oh, the sons of God are just the line of Seth and the, the daughters of men are the line of Cain. Right. And there's so many textual problems with that. It doesn't even make sense of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 at all. But like the main argument for that is we don't like the fallen angel view. Right. He just said angels can't do that. Well, he didn't. Like we just talked about that. So therefore, it must be my view. And it's like, make an argument for your view. And they right. really don't, or they have very few that they try to mm. try to use, but none of them hold up. Yeah, because you you brought it up earlier. the The verse they'll use is um, the angels in heaven aren't given to marriage. Yeah, right? Matthew twenty two thirty. But, yep. but that's specifically talking about the angels in heaven. Yeah. But when the angels came to earth, and you mentioned multiple times where that happened, you know, Abraham, mm-hmm. Sodom, and Gomorrah. Um, and later, Judy even said they left their proper abode. They left. Ex- they left exactly. the place they were supposed to be. Yeah. Exactly. So, do you think that the angels that came and ate with Abraham and that grabbed Lot, do you think they were just these like ethereal spirit things that sit on your shoulder and whisper good tidings? Probably not. If I, they can eat, yeah. if they can eat, they can probably do other human things well, too. And not only that, remember the the men of Sodom wanted to. Exactly. I, I think they yeah. appeared human. I think they they looked human. Yeah. If they if they were, you know, hmm. like you'll see these. You know how so many times we just we swing from like one side of the pendulum to the other, and so we have this view of angels that are like the the long blonde hair and they're glowy right, and they float, right. or they play a harp and people are right. objecting to that. And so then you see like the exact opposite where people are like, well, here's a biblical view of angels and it has this creature with eyes all over the place, like. No, those are the four living creatures in heaven. Not every single right. angel is described that way. You have the seraphim who have six wings, two they cover their feet, two they cover their eyes, and the two they fly. That's Isaiah 6. You have uh, some of them described with like uh, four wings, like the cherubim who are made in the, that are at least depicted in certain places. So they're, to, to, the, we'll go to one extreme or the other, but how about we just look at what the Bible talks about? And in this yeah. case, they, they appear to be humanoid and and they at least appear in human form not some sort of monstrous creature that the men of sodom like hey that looks inviting right that'd be so weird (laughs) yeah i mean mean, they'd be weird no matter what but (laughs) they were messed up i don't know if they were that messed up you know this like crazy hybrid thing walks in yeah it's it's angels are angels just a word okay but we lump a lot of stuff in there Mm -hmm. and biblically there's a lot of different kinds of angels. Yeah. And they play different roles. They have different tasks. They have different authority. That's a, um, that's a great point. I think people are going to be shocked when we are with the Lord that how diverse mm-hmm. uh, the, the spiritual beings are up yeah. there. It's not, oh, <sighs> not, you don't all just look uh, like this one thing? No. <laughs> right. It's going to be very diverse. are not diverse. just chubby babies on clouds <laughs> playing harps, <laughs> yes. right? Yep. Yeah. And, and we don't become that either, which, just for the record. Right. We don't Total. become angels. Right. Correct. And, yeah. And we get glorified bodies uh, like Jesus had after he had yeah, right. And that's what we get. That, that makes sense because I had 
um, okay, the idea that the fallen angels, so the, it says that they left their first estate, right? They left their abode. It doesn't say that they went back. Okay. No. Whereas the angels that no, it, would it actually appear... says that they're held in chains of darkness until the day of judgment. They're they're bound. Ooh. Okay. So yeah, that's a great point because the other angels, the ones that appear to Abraham, the ones that um would appear to like Paul and let him out of prison, um, the ones we talked about before, they would appear, they would fulfill their task, and they were gone. Yep. They would go back to their abode, their first estate. Yep. Right. These other ones likely abandoned that estate, mm -hmm. abandoned that um, that state of being, per se, mm -hmm. and stuck around, did their task, and it was so abominable that God imprisoned them, etern uh, imprisoned them until they're to be released, right? Um, I think that's Un until the Revelation. Yeah, so uh, Jude 6, of the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned mm. their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then Oof. he compares it to Sodom and Gomorrah, the people who went after strange flesh. And so wow. in that same context. And then Peter does almost the exact same thing in Second Peter 2, 4. Um, it's very similar. He talks about it. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. First Peter 3 talks about these angels or the spirits who sinned in Noah's day while the ark was mm. being built. And um, so God has... Uh, so, yeah, you just all three it's, of them. It's every, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's it's I. To me, when I understood this stuff, or when it, you know, it kind of came together for me, I was like, oh my gosh, it literally all makes sense. Like <laughs> everything from the beginning to the end, it's no longer confusing. I don't want to skim through things <laughs> now. I want to like get into the details even more because I'm like every single thing in here means something. Right. Pretty yeah. significant. Mm -hmm. It's not in there just like in passing for us to skip over. Even yeah. like genealogies mean so much more now to me. Yep. Where right. I'm like, oh my goodness, I can see how this guy bred with this and produced this. And those are the people that Israel was at war with at this point in time. Like it all just kind of comes together for me now, you know? So it's 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 super exciting, this topic. And it's super it, it's fun mm -hmm. because one of the um okay, let's just go there. One of the <laughs> it's a safe space, right? Um, uh, one of the, the things people are saying nowadays is because it's all over the news, you know, it's mainstream, it's on, it's what like Joe Rogan and all these guys are talking about all these cultural figures today. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's on the tips of everybody's tongues and minds is all of these supernatural or, um, UAPs or alien encounter things that the Pentagon's talking about, Fox news is talking about, Tucker's talking about, like it's everywhere it's no longer in the shadows and being hidden now the government's coming out and disclosing stuff so you've got kind of two sides to what's happening you've got people that are um observing it and are saying oh these are aliens from another planet they are uh possibly the 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 beings that seeded us mm -hmm. you're seeing a lot of this yeah, genesis Spermia. creation yep. type mm -hmm. okay you've got those folks and then you've got the other side which are like the biblically backed side which are also trying to interpret what's happening because it's kind of difficult at this point you still have people that do but it's difficult to make an argument that like uh, everybody's just making stuff up. No, everything's fake. Yeah, the Pentagon's making it up. Congress is having BS hearings. You know what I mean? It's yep. hard to kind of kind of ignore what's happening and you stick your head, to in the sand. your head in the sand to do that. But but a, exactly, lot of, right. a lot of people are more comfortable doing that because it's just weird and they don't sure. want to talk it's about it. So it's cognitive dissonance. You yep. don't your brain doesn't know what to do with this reality that's in front of you. So you choose to ignore it and go on with life. Yep. But from a biblical perspective, we've got two categories of beings that God ever created. We have human and we've got the angelic. Mm -hmm. Some of those fell. OK, but they are still in the category of created angelic being. Mm -hmm. So when things start appearing in the sky, is it wild to say that, oh, I highly doubt that those are the angels that God's sending, even though we see that in the Bible, right? We've mentioned several times God sent angels to do certain tasks. Yep. But I doubt God is sending angels to appear in the heavens as these balls of light or flickering things that go to and fro, define the laws of physics and all that. 
leaving people confused, scared, questioning, nothing to it doesn't bring God any glory. It doesn't lead people to Jesus. You know, they're not bringing a message of repentance or salvation or anything like no, that. No, they're doing it, the opposite. It's the no, exact they're, opposite. They're denying that Jesus is anything special. They'll say he he was just like us, and you don't have mm-hmm. to, you don't have to fear you know death because you just get to be with us. And it's like okay, so Jesus is nothing special, and there's no judgment. That's what they're telling right. you, which is denying the gospel. Right. So I'm sure you would agree, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but based on what you just said, you'd probably agree that the things appearing are somehow connected or affiliated with or are directly these fallen angel entities. Um, or at least some sort of phenomena that they are um, causing. If it's, not, mm. if, it, if it's not them physically doing it, they're causing it somehow. And I'm not saying every case. I, I, let me just right. make sure. Uh, people. I'm not huge on all the, the UAP. In fact, I've only heard the term a couple of times. I know that's the new term. Uh, right. Um, unidentified um, anomalous phenomena or something. But I'm still, I'm still stuck on UFO because I'm not up to, up <laughs> right. to date on all this. But um, I, I've thought for a long time that because of the messaging that is coming from the, mm. you know, people who are claiming to have channeled these aliens or, uh, you know, the, that the psychic messages that we're getting it it's it's clearly a denial of the gospel mm, why would aliens right. if there were any come thousands of light years to earth just to tell us that jesus isn't anything special and right <laughs> clearly, like that's your they, purpose yeah clearly <laughs> they're giving up their um they, they protest too much it, it, it right exactly what's going yeah. on um and i've read some of the the accounts um and uh, so especially the stuff from the 80s and 90s. Um, but if you look at when a lot of this started, so like the whole modern UFO craze started in 1947. Uh, was it Kenneth Arnold flying over up in Washington, Oregon or something like that and saw these um, discs or whatever, you know, flying nearby. And so from that time, it, it picked up rapidly. Well, what was going on in 1947? Hmm. World War II? World War II just ended. Yes. And uh, there are certain people <laughs> group that was heading back to the land they used to live in for a thousand for a long time and Ooh. and in 1947 the un voted that israel could become a nation again and then in 1948 they did declare independence mm, yeah. wow. all of it corresponds to that um Whoa. So Whoa. It's, which i think is very interesting because obviously if you depending on how you interpret scripture and how you understand end time events I, I think it's very clear israel's supposed to be back in their land they are and when the right. Bible talks about Israel, I think the Bible means Israel. I don't think it means something different. Right. And um, somehow the Jews have remained an identifiable ethnic group for 2,000 years, even though they didn't have their own land. And they just happened to get their own land back. And they just happened to be the most persecuted people on the face right. of the earth. No matter what they do, if they're, if they're peaceful or if they're not peaceful, they, they still are right. persecuted and hated. We see it even since October 7th. They get somebody launches a terrorist attack against them. And what happens? All fault. of our universities, people are protesting against them. It's like, no, these are the right. people who just were slaughtered, and uh, yeah. it's, it's it's heinous. But there is a real spiritual attack and a satanic uh, yeah. inspired attack against them throughout history. And um, I think it's because God has said these people will be here, and Satan is doing everything he can to make sure that they're not. But that's ooh. Fascinating. So um, you definitely have my conspiracy wheels thing spinning. So okay, but but let's tie this in a, in a different way. So you you have yeah. these encounters where people claim to be taken aboard a spacecraft, and mm-hmm. I don't think anybody's actually taken aboard a spacecraft. I think maybe there's some sort of something psychically. I don't know. Like if you could mm, see that sure. in their room, I don't I don't think they leave their room necessarily. I, it might all be here. I'm not sure. Um, maybe that maybe they're floating through. I don't know, but I don't think so. Um, but I know. That what happens a lot of times, those people are claiming to, when they're abducted, these alien abduction scenarios, they claim to be um, probed, usually sexually. Like mm, there's, there's mm. Some, Maybe that's just to scare them to death, I mean, because that's what it would do. And no matter what's happening, all of this is taking people's focus off of God. You know, if there right. are aliens, if there's something else, interdimensional beings, well, then we don't have to look to God for answers. We can look to these entities. Um, right. Is it possible that these entities are trying to do it again? 
what happened before the flood and, it, and yeah. maybe, maybe they don't have the same sort of abilities or power that the the sons of god did the b'nai elohim yeah. that were doing it before and these other ones are trying to figure it out are they the same ones that in medieval times we called the incubus and succubus you know the demons who would assault women or men in the middle of the night mm. um are the same ones that augustine talked about in four in the 400s called the sylvans and fawns who would make assault on women in the middle of the night um and wow. is it just that whatever period of time you are in, they're, the way they reveal themselves is in a way that captures your imagination. So you're not going to have space beings before the space age. But you'd, right. have, you'd have these monsters of the of the forest or you know these demons in the night or something like that doing it. Um, and maybe that's all just unterrified, but I, I also know that there are a lot of... Um, reported cases where when the person cried out to jesus in the middle of the encounter it just stopped instantly right um i've heard seems that seems like a weird mm. thing for an alien from light years away to do and but, <laughs> Great. Uh, oh no <laughs> <laughs> that name yeah the, the one that you don't have to worry about that he's nothing special suddenly i gotta stop what i'm doing and yeah <laughs> Great point. Yeah, exactly. Great point. Exactly. And they don't even like speak English. They're just like <laughs> boop, boop, beep, boop. But then when you say <laughs> Jesus, they like freak out, right. <laughs> take off. That's hilarious. Yeah. So I think there's a connection, but I'm not going to say, hey, every single time that somebody reports a UFO or every single time somebody does that. Right. And, and I guess to go, to, to go back on the one thing I said, I'm not sure if they actually go anywhere. Maybe that's not quite accurate. I think that there are one of the movie, the Fire in the Sky movie that came out in the 90s, where it, I don't remember the name of the guy, but mm -hmm. it's a real popular thing where he was missing for some time. And mm. he, he's the one that claimed to have been abducted and to have been probed. And he took lie detector tests and everything. And um, mm. But I think he actually was not there anymore. And so I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what ability yeah. or what powers they have. So, yeah. I, um, I mean, having talked to like L.A. Marzuli. You know, he thinks that the abductions are real and they're actually taking like genetic material to possibly mimic what they did pre-flood, you know, and and after mm -hmm. whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of men. Right. Um, maybe now coming into the daughters of men or marrying the, the women isn't the way that they go about it anymore. Maybe now, because, again, we think of demons and satan as these like ethereal spirits that whisper naughty things right but they're not they've got they're they're at war they've got tact they've got skill they've got things that they're doing right mm -hmm. strategies that they're implementing for centuries that they could be working at right mm -hmm. um so what if instead of impregnating women waiting for them to give birth raising little little demon children nephilim children that then grow up and now man doesn't live beyond 120 and that's at this point in time a rarity mm -hmm. so you know the environment whatever has effect on humans genetic decay humanity dies let's say you're lucky if you hit like 85 right um what if the the strategy now is not to produce nephilim through women but through uh genetic alteration mutation mm. create all sorts of different um all sorts of different entities with human genetics you know what i mean yeah. and that's obviously that's obviously deep in the realm of speculation well but I, I i think if you go back to you know what was happening pre-flood the nephilim are being produced they're giants and then even mm -hmm. post-flood at that time that makes sense because if you're going to fight a battle the bigger, stronger, more powerful, the more mm. likely you are to win. That's not necessarily the case anymore. Like, if if you have a giant on your side for a battle, I mean, most of it's not done through infantry anymore. It's right. all through right. air. I mean, we. Right. I don't care if you have fifty giants. We can launch some Tomahawk cruise missiles from a thousand miles away and take care of you. It's that's not right. how we win the war anymore. Now it's more tactical, and so maybe that's the thing they're attempting to do. If that's the case, I don't know that they need to produce giants anymore but right back until the days before um bow and arrow became real prominent you, that probably was a pretty good or pretty effective way to win battles unless you're fighting against the team that has god on its side but right <laughs> and right. the ark of the covenant so that's, which that's they <laughs> and they would take it into battle yeah and the philistines saw it as a weapon yeah you know um 
Yeah. So it might just be that the strategy changed. It might be that they're, you know, they're coming up concocting something else. And maybe that, to the, maybe just to distract, I mean, because that's all you need. But really, if you think about it from Satan's perspective, uh, and not that I can psychoanalyze him or anything, nor what I want to. Mm -hmm. And um, but really, two things: distract unbelievers and make believers unfruitful, or you know, mm. just keep just keep people ineffective believers make them ineffective unbelievers keep their focus off of god you know yeah, right, with right. anything and you've done your job you don't have to get everybody to believe that that satan really even exists you, he, right just keep their focus off of god and um and this would certainly do it i mean if you if people are believing that there are aliens from all over the place or that we're just you know th that we actually come from aliens you know like panspermia idea that they sure. did life on earth yeah um, then Genesis isn't true. God didn't make man from the dust of the ground. And Jesus being the descendant sure. of Adam, big deal. He's just it's another, he's yeah. like the aliens, it's really. Done. I mean, it's just. Um, it, yeah, if you if you go there mentally, okay. I know some people are like, oh, these guys are crazy. What the heck are they talking about? I thought we were talking about the Bible. Okay. But if you just go there mentally, right, as a thought experiment, mm -hmm. and you're like, how do you think modern day humans with technology and cameras and internet and all of it, social media, would react if something actually manifested from the heavens, okay, appeared to prominent figures like presidents, like kings, like whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And was like, boo, boo, beep, boo. We are from wherever. We actually created you guys. And check out our cool technology. Pew, pew, pew. And they like shoot laser beams or dismantle a person and reassemble him mm -hmm. in real life you know like on camera and i think the world would come to a complete halt as we know it and these things would become our gods they are our creators right they might even tell us we created you guys we made you check yeah. it out i just disassembled this guy i just put him back together and he's he's still conscious he's still alive and i think we would move into this global man, I don't know what you want to call it, but this like this global worship of these entities in sure. particular. Okay. And if the, if the um, strategy before when the Nephilim were around was to use them for war against God's people, what a coincidence that in Revelation, what is the dragon preparing for and rising up kingdoms for? to war against the rider on the white horse yeah you know what i mean mm -hmm. um, well, and and to go along with that if and it depends on people's views of the end time and that, i don't get into that in the book really but you know if there is a rapture you know seven years or so before christ mm -hmm. returns to the earth what's the explanation for it? i mean obviously as christians we're like well we know what happened because we're with the lord right now and everybody right. else is still down there well that was uh, that was the rapture but what are they going to be thinking like oh i missed the rapture or it was like Wait, did the did our gods, did our did these aliens zap them yeah. off the earth because they were the ones right, holding right. Them back from world peace? Because these are the people who hated the trans people, which we don't. But they're the you know what I mean. Right. They, that's that's what we yeah. hear all the time. Is that yeah. Um, yeah. that Christians are the ones who hate all these people, and it's like no, we're we're commanded to love everyone, um, love your enemy, love your neighbor, love one another. That kind of covers everybody, and that's yeah that's what we're supposed to do. That that would be the time to appear yeah. is after the rapture. Well, and Jesus even talked about even the very elect would be deceived if it were possible. So it, exactly. I think, in, exactly. in fact, that's what he warns in Matthew 24 over and over again, see that no one deceives you. I think mm. that is repeated mm. like three times in that passage. So mm. be careful about these. Uh, many will say that I am the Christ. You know, that, that right. There's even going to be somebody, people who are claiming to be him, which is, ironic that throughout history we've had people claiming to be christ but you don't have a right. people running around claiming to be muhammad or right. gandhi mm. or, or i mean or um buddha or anything like that you have people claim to be the christ and right. yeah they're not only jesus is <laughs> yeah i know yeah. that do you guys mind if we take a potty break no <laughs> sure it's just fascinating dude it's so fun this is a legit conversation about Nephilim. It's so cool. Oh, so fun. He, he is solid. Yeah, man. I love it. I, I love, so solid. I love speculating, but then being like drawn back to reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got some more, a couple more questions because we only have them for like 20 more minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me... Uh, da, da, da. Tim, we were just saying how much fun we're having. 
Oh, I'm having fun too. I mean, it's uh, more speculative than I, I usually get into because my book doesn't do a whole lot of that. I mean, I'm familiar I with it. I haven't read it. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, the last five, I do have one chapter called Giant Speculations where I get into the cannibal thing. Um, and then there are about five or six chapters at the very end after like the Bible study where it's like, hey, are the modern alien ufo thing is that related it's the um the constellation thing is that related right. and so i get into some of those things that are a bit speculative but i, I save that for the end and sure yeah yeah we, we our flow naturally gets there because it's 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 happening yeah. it's happening so we need to we need to deal with it right and as christians i mean this is our explanation hey well, things happen in in ancient history and things like that might happen again. You know, and I'm glad you're doing this. And maybe we can bring this up that um, when we're recording again, the. Uh, we're already recording. Oh, Go ahead. We, we're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're good. We're good. Uh, yeah, um, we'll, we'll spice it and stuff. Yeah. So we will, we will, don't worry. This whole yeah. topic that, that we're talking about, there are so many, you know, there are so many ways that Christians can share the gospel. Obviously, the gospel message is about the death, sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And yeah. that we need to believe in him. But, um, a lot of people won't go through the doors of a church to hear that. And and yet you have a lot of people who, for one reason or another, are just super fascinated with this topic, with the yeah. Nephilim, people, unbelievers who are, who are interested in it. And why would we, as believers, not at least mention it? Or at least, right. I mean, it's in Scripture for a reason. God doesn't right. just put it in there and say, oh, by the way, just skip those four verses every time you get there. And... Be, be embarrassed. Be yeah. embarrassed. Don't bring it up. Right. Or like the whole book of Revelation. Yeah, don't read that. Even though the very beginning of the book is the only one that says you're blessed if you read this. And, and start, mm. it's the, the only book mm. that says that. And we just kind of gloss over it. So I think great it's a point. great opportunity to reach certain people that would never be reached in, in different ways, or at least would rarely be reached in different ways, because yeah. um, they're not going to go to church or they're they're not interested in having a conversation. Uh, you know, not, they're not here asking you yeah. about the gospel or, but, Hey, what about this whole thing I saw on um, ancient aliens on TV about the Nephilim and all that? Totally. Yeah. To like, well, Hey, let's I can't talk about that. Tim, I have personal examples, multiple in my life where I've talked either. Actually, it's funny. Both times it's the same thing. Uh, starts with politics and how crazy the world is. Leads into what do you think about this alien stuff? <laughs> Leads into you know the, I'm Christian. The Bible talks about this, and this is what we believe. Da, 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 da. Leads into yeah, and it's all about Jesus, and that's why he came back to save us, to get us away from another. And now we're his sons and daughters. And and I have multiple people that have come to faith through these conversations. That's awesome. And it wasn't a. Do you want to hear about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You know, right. it wasn't one of those. <laughs> right. It wasn't that at all. But the thing is, I and I honestly, and we say this in our in our interviews often. I think Christians need to own these fringe topics or what were fringe because now they're mainstream. Mm -hmm. Now Pentagon, Congress, uh, um, presidents, people are talking about it blatantly and openly, right? So people, I think their worldview is now expanding. To realize, oh, maybe this like naturalist thing isn't all there is anymore. You know, I think that the church is suffering for, in the West, at least, and, and maybe around the world. But we, in a sense, we are very naturalistic other than mm. we, make, we make room for God. That's we a good make point. room for Jesus and the uh, his miracles and maybe right. some of the other ones that we read about in the Bible. But we don't like to talk about them much. Mm, um, right. l l and. And that's unfortunate because the Bible is supernatural. The Bible has a, the Bible shows us it's a supernatural world, and there really is a real battle against the spiritual forces. As Paul talks about in Ephesians six. Um, look at what you know when Paul goes to the, this town, and the, there's the, the demon possessed girl who's kind of mocking yeah. him, and he casts the demon because they're trying to prevent him from doing what he's doing. And do you think mm -hmm. that that just suddenly stopped? At some point, mm -hmm. that there's no more demonic deception, um, even though Peter no says that uh, when he wrote his first letter, that the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. What he, he's not doing it anymore? No, I, right. it's a real <laughs> spiritual battle, and I, it's unfortunate that the church has become so uncomfortable talking about it. And I, and I don't know if it's because I mentioned before we're so reactionary, and you have, um, and I'm not trying to put any any denomination down or anything, but you have like the 
like in the really um some pentecostal or charismatic that like, kind of go to the extreme about everything right. is like supernatural and, right. and, and we're like oh we don't want to look like that and so instead of moderating and being like in the book okay, let's look at a balance like let's just do everything we can to not look like that and right. that's right. not the way to handle it it's what does the bible say and um yeah so the bible tells us there's real spiritual powers who really try to deceive people who uh, that we need to be uh, concerned about we don't have to fear them as john tells us greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world right but right. at the same time we have to understand that um that satan has blinded the eyes of the people of this world he's the god of this world paul says in mm. corinthians and um we we have to rescue people from that kingdom by by sharing the gospel and yeah and for for in some cases it's going to be through something like the nephilim or the like, as you mentioned or it might be you know maybe there's people who love military strategy and they're like oh mm. the book of joshua sure has a whole bunch of this and they start getting really fascinated by what the bible talks right. about and eventually they read more of it and oh there's the gospel um you right know, whatever it is that the person is interested in the you can use the bible to get them to where they need to be yeah i agree amen all that um we were talking a little bit earlier about how if things start appearing, and this, again, to me, this is relevant to the conversation of Nephilim giants, fallen angels, because in my opinion, that's what we're seeing now is fallen angels at work once again, or 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 the demonic at work in a, in a more, I want to say like physical maybe way in our dimension, you know, mm -hmm. rather than just this behind the scenes spiritual relevance. Um, and so I was saying earlier, if things actually manifested undeniably went to leaders, I think humanity's reaction would be worship, you know, and interestingly enough in the old, Te uh, not old Testament in revelation, it says that, um, that humanity worships the beast mm -hmm. and he comes with signs and wonders calling down fire from heaven. Okay. This is, this is language to describe something um, that John 2000 years ago on an island of Patmos in a vision was seeing. And from heaven comes this thing, burns up this thing on the ground. And he's like, oh, fire came from heaven. It could, he could have easily been describing uh, like a laser. He could have easily been describing technology. Well, you know what I mean? But not only that, you have in Revelation. So a lot of people are think oh every generation says they're the last generation and i'm not right. taking dates here or anything i mean i know right. it's gonna be 2033 so there's no no i'm just kidding this is a clip so, so many people, they're, they're like oh every generation thinks they're the last one okay but revelation very plainly talks about how the, the the beast a lot of people think it's antichrist depending on your interpretation how you understand these things um is going to implement this thing where nobody can buy or sell unless you have this <laughs> Totally. mark or this you know yeah. the, which is this number um well how could that have been done 50 years ago or 100 years right. on it did we just see in the last couple of years how that could be done yes yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you, you know you mm -hmm. have people with like these different um vac vaccine passports or whatever that you can't right. even come in, you can't buy or sell unless you have this there was country right. doing that um yeah and so it's very easy to see how that could be done or uh like the two witnesses that they are in jerusalem and they get killed and their bodies lie in the streets for three and a half days and everybody around the world sees them right how can that happen well guess what it can happen i was just in fiji yeah, last right. week and even in the remote areas guess what nearly every single body every person has that's crazy wow. yep. so yep. everybody could see that i mean it, those are things that we look today and like that makes perfect sense that right. makes perfect sense i don't know if there's like yeah. three or four or five other things that'll have to fall into place for that to make perfect sense but what I do know is it makes more sense now than it did 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Oh, and by the right. way, Israel's back in the land. So when the Bible's talking about Jerusalem and the you know the Jews being there and everything, well, they And sacrifices. Are. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. that's all there, too. So all of these things are, you know, I don't know how many lines have to come together, but a lot of them are together. And maybe there's a few more that need to come in. But we just need to be ready no matter when it is. And we have to... But occupy till he till he comes and yeah. uh, share the gospel with with those with whoever we can because it's the power of God and the salvation. Yeah. Okay. Last question for you because we got sixteen, fourteen, fifteen minutes exactly right now. Mm -hmm. um, if they if something appears and humanity's reaction is to worship, is it possible that, like I said, 
an hour and a half ago. Ancient civilizations claim things appeared to them, okay? And their reaction was worship. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the same reaction. That's what humans do. Um, do you think that the gods of the Sumerians, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Assyrian, do you think, even the Egyptians, a, a lot of these guys, Native Americans, a lot of them have accounts of supernatural beings appearing to them and giving them knowledge, wisdom, technology, da 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 da, da And they worship them, mm -hmm. okay? Do out you of, think... Usually out of fear. Sure. It, it, was, it wasn't sure. Out of gratitude and, and sure. thankfulness, but, like, we, like we, we serve in the Lord. But yeah, exactly. That's right. but, get, but guess what? The Antichrist performs signs and wonders. Well, I was going to read and that. And kills and kills people that don't worship him. It, it, so, so you even have in Second Thessalonians here to answer your question. I, I think we'll mm -hmm. go deeper, but the coming of the lawless one, who a lot of people think is the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power, not some power, mm. all power, signs, and lying wonders. It doesn't say false miracles. It, it, he, he's a, he's able to do things that we would be amazed at. And right. Says, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And mm. so, yeah, there are going to be people who fall hook, line, and sinker for it because they, they've rejected the truth and they'll fall for the, the greatest lie ever told. And yeah. they're going to they're gonna worship the, the wrong god they're going to worship the false god and yeah revelation's full of descriptions about that as well that if they don't take his mark you're dead right you know? and how right. many people who will just say well i'll take it because i don't want to die um, right no and those who don't take it and worship him i should say so that's that's what that yeah yeah there's definitely a uh worship needs to happen in order for the full effect to take well, yeah, and that's what, Hold, that's what it know. says that, um, let's see. Yeah, he causes, this Revelation 13, he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on the right hand of their foreheads that no one may buy or sell without that mark. Um, and before that, oh, and causes many as would not worship the image to be, to be killed. So in verse 15, mm -hmm. if they don't worship, they die. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the mark of the beast is connected with worship. It's almost as if if you take this, you are worshiping. Right. I mean, yeah, I know like in the Left Behind series, if people remember that if they read that there somebody is I don't remember if they're drugged or they were unconscious and somebody gave them the mark and they weren't actually condemned right. because of that. Yeah, maybe that for, <laughs> because it, it has to be a conscious thing. God's not going to condemn you yeah. for something that you had right. no uh, ability right. to <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, do you do you think that the um, do you think that these ancient civilizations that claim things appear to them and then they worship them as gods? Do you think that they're telling the truth and that things really did appear to them? Yeah. And so going back to what we talked about with Babel earlier on, mm -hmm. where where God disinherits the nation, maybe, maybe we can explain that a little bit more. So Dr. Heiser explains that a lot in Unseen Realm. So in Deuteronomy thirty-two verses seven, eight, and nine, God tells uh, through Moses, um, you know. Ask your fathers, they will tell you. When the Most High divided the nations, you know, talking about Babel, he separated right. the, the, the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So these entities that God put in control over the nations, you look at Deuteronomy 4.19 and also in 20.29, I think it is, uh, where it describes that, that God is giving these gods, lowercase g, to the nations to rule over them. And I think that when that happened, oh, 32 goes on and God says, I get Israel. It doesn't mm -hmm. even exist yet. That's my portion. Mm -hmm. um, so this nation doesn't even exist yet, but I'm going to take one man and I'm going to make a nation and I'm going to win. And that's, that's what the rest of the, the Bible really is playing mm -hmm. out. And um, so I, I think that that's what those entities were doing. They were supposed to be mm. leading people into truth. But instead you look at Psalm 82 and you see how they were oppressing the people. and they they weren't doing what they were called to do, and so Psalm eighty two describes their judgment as well. That God's going to um, God's going to judge them. They're going to die like any prince or die like any man. Yeah, yeah. So you think that they these civilizations are these civilizations were being honest when they were describing these encounters, and technically, from a biblical perspective, they are the fallen angels, or they are the 
angels which were or the Elohim which were put over the specific territories. Yeah, I mean, I I would look at it like a maybe like any other uh, maybe not any other but a lot of the false religions today so uh, think of like mormonism did joseph smith really see the angel moroni did he really see golden right. plates um it wouldn't surprise me if he really saw something i don't totally know that right. he really had golden <laughs> plates that he was translating or anything like that i, I mean um, i mean how many other religions all start or have some kind of genesis like this yeah a being came to me and told me, blah, 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 blah. Even Islam's like that, you know, that hundred percent. Yeah. You have, you have a lot of these, so it doesn't, it would not surprise me for, uh, for a second, if uh, many of these other ancient cultures, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, all that their, uh, their pantheon, their, their gods and goddesses, at least some of that is based in a, um, in a reality that there really were entities or an entity that, revealed that to them now mm. i think you probably get a lot of distortion you get a lot of um religious writing that goes along with that that becomes legend and of course these ones don't care that they're, they're they're leading you into falsehoods anyway so right. who cares if you get all sorts of distortions of that um so i'm not saying that every single thing you see about the sumerians or these other ones that they're all exactly what happened but um yeah i think that there is a a reality behind it. Mm. Okay. <sighs> Dennis, what else, bro? <laughs> I've got one more, but if you've got anything, Dennis. No, I'm just fascinated. I have, there's so much information and I, uh, it answers a lot of like what was floating around in my head for a long time now. Cause I, and I, and I am so happy that Tim agrees with the stuff that is in my head. <laughs> you're, you're, I think More or less. We were talking about before the show, you're very redhead right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah don't be alarmed. It's not, this is not from the information. I think I got redder during the Dennis show. Dennis is just getting like more and more angry. He's <laughs> <laughs> happy because he's mad at what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. He's got like steam coming out of his ears. You're a cartoon character over there, man. It just, it just, it just, uh, everything that we're talking about really. Uh, brings to life, you know, the Bible even more and uh, from creation yeah. to, to today and, and the seriousness of it too, right? Like, uh, it's not just a fantasy story. It's not just something that we should just believe in because someone, you know, because the, our, our other people around us believe in it or, you know, we were taught this since a kid. It's like, this is like a war. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is real life. The seed war, right? Like what they call it. Like it's, this is real and every yes we translate it to our everyday lives also of you know the war of our, of our flesh right the war of, of the, the idols that we have in our own life you know we can translate it anyway but it's also just this it's not just translated in our everyday life it's it's actually happening in the these unseen realms that we live in you know right now that are all around us um i still the whole communication part of it the whole how they how humans interact with these beings or is just, is fascinating to me. It's like, and, and it's, I think we're going to see more and more of it, you know, as we go. And then you get AI, right. The technology that you kind of implement now into all this as well. That's just, is blowing my mind, you know? So mm. I, I can't wait to your next book, Tim, when you're going to include the AI yeah, stuff. What you know, else you got? You got anything on the horizon, Tim? <laughs> uh, not, not as far as AI goes and not even on this topic. I mean, I've written other things. I've got a book on the, the resurrection. That's actually my favorite topic, man. I like oh, it. cool. I love talking about the resurrection of Jesus and what that that'll means. be our, that'll be our next discussion. What's, there what's we go. That called? <laughs> what's that called? Tim? That one's called in defense of Easter. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, cool. Answering critical challenges of the resurrection of Jesus. And then I've uh, done several novels. Um, there's a Noah really trilogy. yeah Noah trilogy that's like a historical fiction um it's kind of like the official backstory for Noah and his family at the Ark Encounter but it um takes you from Noah as the time of a young man up until uh the flood comes so it gives you a glimpse into that world and what that Ooh. may have been like um oh my gosh. fiction uh like a 10 book series called the Truth Chronicles um time travel adventure to the pre-flood world and that kind of stuff so um <laughs> yeah so I've got to do a lot of stuff in this area um not those ones don't really deal so much with the sons of God and the Nephilim issue. Mm. Um, well, there are some giants described in the Noah books, but I, I can't talk about where they came from because then that gets gives it away. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Dude, that sounds that sounds fascinating. That sounds like a really fun read. Oh, thanks. Yeah, there. Do you have those on audio? Uh, I just I just looked no. them on my hoopla app, but they're not there. That like, would be a really cool, like yeah. especially if you got voice actors to do it. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. That is it. 
Would it be appropriate for like kids? So the Truth Chronicles is for kids. The Noah series, um, I would, yes, they could read it. I mean, I want to say little kids. Sure. It's more, for, be, yeah. more like high school on up. But, uh, you know, if you have a good reader in sixth or seventh grade, they could handle the reading. Um, it does have to, to describe the most wicked world that's ever been, but do it in a family friendly way. And so I, yeah, I try to keep it to the level that the Bible does, which, you know, right. Bible's not always just PG. You, you look at right, what happened to right. Joseph and Potiphar's wife, or you look at right. Song of Solomon, or you look at the end of Judges. It's the, oh, oof. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. really bad. Um, but so I try not to go that far, but I'm trying to keep it family friendly. But there are some concepts being described, or if there's the yeah. violence being described, it's a little bit from a distance. So you don't have to get in there and describe the blood and gut so much. And, is yeah. there any advanced technology in that Noah's world so, fictional yeah, let's, tale? Let's address that real quickly because you brought it up before. Um, yeah. If they had, uh, I think they probably had different technological means than we give them credit for. Sure. Um, I don't think they would have had anything that would allow them to fly into space or to survive uh, like a submarine or anything like that to survive anything that would sure. allow them to survive the flood that didn't happen. Hmm. So, um, as far as whatever else they might have had, well, they had enough for Noah to build the ark. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty remarkable achievement in and of itself. And then within just a, a few generations, you got these people building a city and a tower at Babel. Right. And and that's after essentially a technological reset. So the the flood happens, all that technology is gone, except for what Noah might right. have brought on board the ark. And we don't know all of what he brought on there. And then at Babel, you get, you know, just a little bit, a few generations later, and then it's almost like another reset as people go their own way and they just, mm. they're kind of starting over. So a lot of what we find archaeologically when people are like, oh, the Stone Age or, you know, the, the Calcolithic Age, that kind of thing. That's all post Babel as people are just getting started after that. Mm. Yeah, um, it's interesting that I think up until I think the Tower of Babel is the first time it says that people made bricks and started building. And I think before that, it reference it makes reference to people were using stone. And I don't know if I read that somewhere or if I'm totally just making it up on the spot. Um, but, so it does talk about in Genesis 11. It says, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. That's in yeah. Genesis 11.3. I can't think of anything before the flood that tells us what they were making it out of. So it does say that Cain built a city and named it after his son Enoch. Um, yeah. It doesn't tell us what it's made out of. So, Okay, so I might have just made up the fact that before it references bricks that they were building out of stone. But yeah, in, in this case, in the plain of Shinar, it said they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar, so the tar or something. So they had that's the what it was. bitumen, I think is what yeah, I was yeah. describing. So that seems to be something that is uh, a result of the flood. Yeah. Um, so that wherever they, so in that plain of Shinar, that was available to them i don't know if they would have been able to use that same material pre-flood yeah that tar i mean even to this day i think that area is known for tar pits okay uh i recently read this looked it up and that area was known for tar pits so i think that's what that's what stuck out to me was that it says uh they had bricks for stone so from that i deduced oh interesting so post-flood the first big thing they try building comes from they use bricks whereas before they had a notion of stone building mm -hmm. you know um and th this all stems this this fascination with like advanced technology pre-flood or pre-catastrophe right it comes from this um it comes from the same ideas that like graham hancock randall carlson joe rogan these guys talk about often which was so many ancient civilizations have accounts of these advanced um, beings coming to them and going around, and they are likely the ones that were referred to as the Atlanteans, the ones that might have survived the flood. But Atlantis could just be referring to the world before Noah, this advanced knowledge base of civilization and technological marvel. Um, and you're right that we don't know what Noah took with him outside okay. of the animals you know but if there's a catastrophe even right now if there's a catastrophe meteor strikes world floods or burns or whatever and there's a few survivors they get out of their holes right and they tell their let's say they have some kids and they're like man we remember the world before 
it was crazy. There was these things you could hold in your hand. You could watch things. There's these things in the sky that will talk to these things I, over here. I could you fly know? my drone from my little phone. and I could fly my drone. I could, yeah. I could fly from here to there. I could ride in this thing that's a car. It looks kind of like this horse we're on now, but it has different wheels. So they would describe the world in a way where the kids would be like, wow, that's really cool. And then those kids would describe it to their grandkids and their grandkids would be like, Really? Grandpa believes that? That's crazy. All I've ever ridden is a horse. I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So over time, that world that people experienced, right? The survivors experience, over time, that world becomes kind of more mythological and more more of a like, okay, grandpa, go back to your bed. You know, yeah. we get it. You experienced this world. Um, and that would happen today. You know, so to think that these nations or these civilizations that arose after the disbursement of Babel, and they all went their own ways with their own tongues, to think that they wouldn't have concepts of the pre-flood world or even the flood event. And we see that now. We see China, Native Americans, Middle Eastern, South, uh, we see African tribe. All of them have notions of a flood. Mm -hmm. Like they carry th that knowledge with them despite being dispersed. Um <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we have we have an exhibit at the Ark Encounter on deck three called Flood Legends. And I, so I read Ooh. over 200 of those legends while I was writing that exhibit. And they truly are all over the place. And it's not just because missionaries went there and told right. them some distorted version of Noah's Ark, which makes no sense. Why would missionaries give you some crazy distorted version? They would tell you about Noah and the Ark. And um, right. when, the, when these anthropologists goes, goes to these people groups, they're not hearing that oh noah this guy named noah built an ark and there were eight people survived no what they're hearing is some guy who has like eight syllables to his name and he built a canoe and and he landed on right. this hill and so there's a like a distorted, they adapt it to their culture yeah and there's it's a distorted version that hmm. that still has that kernel of truth there and it's the same thing not just with the flood but they also have like man being made from the dust of the ground there's a lot of them that have hmm. that not a, it's not as prevalent but they have several uh, there's several that have that. Then you also have a lot of them that the reason man dies or the reason that man is wicked has something to do with a tree and or a serpent. That mm -hmm. is all over the place. Wow. You have the, the gods coming down and mating with women and producing demigods. That's in a lot of those different cultures. Then you have the flood. And we found like 23 different Babel legends as well from around the world mm -hmm. where they sound very similar to the biblical account of Babel. And then Genesis 12 onward, like Abraham, nothing. Wow. We have no Abraham legend, no Isaac, no Jacob or anything. But Genesis 1 through 11, somehow, some way they seem to know. And I think it's because what Genesis 11 describes is exactly right. That the whole world had one language after the flood. And they knew this history. And it, and mm. then they were scattered in Genesis 11. And they took that history with them. It's now in a different language. They pass it on generation after generation. It gets distorted. And distorted, so the yeah. Just go and hear about it. It's. Noah's name's not Noah anymore. It's a, it's a, it's the crazy, a very different name. But he still built a raft or a canoe or a whatever, right. and mm -hmm. took the animals, and there was a flood, and everybody died, and um, yeah. So I, I, I think that's um some pretty good, what do you, what do you call it, anthropological evidence of mm. the biblical account. Yeah, it's interesting that people still try to deny the biblical account when it's like. You guys are just now catching up and starting to say things we've been saying for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if everything else we're saying is true. <laughs> you know? uh, well, Tim, on that note, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, what a great um, conversation. What a great conversation. Oh my gosh, I, had fun. So I learned fun. so much. I learned so much. Thank you, Tim. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. It's, We'd love um, to have you back. I don't usually get to talk about this with a lot of people, so it's been fun to to speculate. It's been fun to dive in. Um, you know, that's I great. think we were clear when we're speculating and when we're not. I mean, I love it. Obviously, love when it. we're talking I... about the gospel, that's not speculating. Jesus is the no, way that the life all. And comes to the Father except it's... through Him. And... Amen. It's fun and Amen. allowable to speculate as long as we're clear. Like, hey, we are not definitively saying this is what we believe. But based on what we have, right, in the text that we're basing these things off of, the, that text, it has implications. It means things looked a certain way. It means life was a certain way. I mean, so for us to try to, like, ponder on that mm -hmm. isn't crazy. It's just natural, right? right? We speculate on a lot of things throughout the day based on information we have. Um, and I, I, I see it as a, dude, for me, it's a blessing. 
you know, because this speculative, these speculations that we're dealing with here, I hear other people in culture talking about like pyramids and Anunnaki and Atlantis and, you know, all these like things that they're then spinning and speculating about. Right. And but I'd they're taking. Them, I'd rather have them get the answers from Bible believing Christians than from right. For uh, sure. Giorgio, whatever his name is on uh, ancient aliens. <laughs> Giorgio, <or> Giorgio Rogan. <laughs> 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 Giorgio Rogan, bro. Yeah. Uh, well, be, because, yeah, yeah, you're right. There, there is a certain narrative being put out by these figures, right? These prominent figures in culture, and it leads not to Jesus, right? Okay, right. or we can have fun and also speculate and come up with answers for the same questions based on the same like observable data and facts and historic events, and we arrive at a conclusion that the Bible kind of concurs with yeah you know sure it's not in there specifically but we can still account for what's being seen and observed and come up with a biblical answer for it yep. what's wrong with that yeah. no, well, it encompasses yeah. it, it encompasses the plan of salvation right the plan of redemption right yeah. this is what we all point to we we talk about it and it's fun for us we speculate but it ultimately does point to god's plan from yeah. the beginning right yeah and to ultimately be with us yeah and i think the one caution i would have for any listeners just don't dwell too long on mm. the enemy. Focus yes. on our mm. Savior. It, because That's great, sure. Tim. The Bible doesn't dwell too long on him. It, it, you get little snippets sure. here and there. You get, a, okay, here's what's going on. Here's what he's doing. But keep our eyes on Christ. And um, it doesn't mean that. you can't, you should be aware of our enemy. You don't want to underestimate him. But at the same time, don't don't let him live rent free in your head. Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't glorify yeah. him. Right. You know? <laughs> Uh, hey, Tim, thank you so much. This is yeah, so thanks, great. Tim. Love to have you back. Uh, remember, guys, thank you so much for, for joining us. Remember to like, follow, subscribe, share, comment, um, take clips, share them with your friends. Um, Tim, feel free to do that too with your, to, to clip this. And uh, let's, let's, let, let's get this conversation out there to as many people as we can. Um, and remembering that we're pointing all this to salvation and Jesus and who he is uh, and that he is our Lord and our savior and our king and he's alive and uh we're here today talking about this stuff because 